One sixth of the aphorisms concerns precisely this recondite aspect of yoga, and one chapter is actually entitled Buddhi, Buddha. How can we account for this obvious pre eminence given to the magical side of the yogic path? Was Patanjali, after all, not such a staunch rationalist as contemporary interpreters have made him out to be? Has he perhaps unwittingly succumbed to the magical trend in yoga, betraying its putative shamanistic origins? These questions can all be instantly disposed of by the simple observation that the powers form an integral part of all yogic endeavor. 101 to 102, however, whether dismissive or accepting, very little effort has been directed toward attempting to provide a coherent explanation of how these these are not only a logical corollary of the parameters of Akian metaphysics but actually inevitable and indispensable to them. These powers Powers were not seen as irrational or pre-philosophical by scholastics whose intellectual and rational accomplishments continue to impress us today but were inevitable by products of the presuppositions of these systems, there are no grounds to suppose that any pre-modern commentators considered them anything other than factual and literal. Narratives of mystical phenomena pervade the entire Indic textual tradition not only epic and puric, it might be noted, but philosophical as well, Vedanta Sutras 4. 4.17, Vaiyaka Sutras 9. 1.11 FF and commentaries, and are commonplace also in Jain and Buddhist traditions, E.G. Buddhak Hoas Visuddhimaga 12 and 13, and the Buddha's hagiography itself 42. Pensa is correct that the question of powers in yoga and Buddhism in particular has not infrequently been taken into consideration in a biased, oversimple or at any rate excessively summary fashion, the prejudice was thus such as to silence the texts, so to speak, 1969, 197. He finds precedent and continuity for this pervasive acceptance of sthis in the dh of the Vedic seers in the earliest Vedic texts. Following Gonda, 1984, 68, he translates dh as exceptional and supernormal faculty, proper to seers, of seeing in the mind things, causes, connections, as they really are, the faculty of acquiring a sudden knowledge of the truth, of the functions and influence of diving powers, 196. Like it or not, these are integral to the entirety of Hindu beliefs from their earliest Vedic beginnings right up until the ongoing hagiographies of modern Hindu mystics. 43 Indeed, tracing imagery from the earliest Upanishads through the Mahabharata, the Yoga Sutras, and into the Tantric traditions, White has argued that the most applicable definition of yoga is precisely that of attainment of mystical powers, a definition that respects both the spirit and the letter of Hindu sources on the uses of the term yoga, in ways that have remained remarkably unchanged from the time of the Upanishads down through the Tantras, 2004, 627, see also White, forthcoming. Now, one might concede this and, again, one suspects, in the hope of salvaging a rational yoga tradition from a more pre-rational mythological backdrop, suggest that Patanjali has included this section simply out of deference to the popular cultural expectations of the day concerning yoga. In support of this position, one can note that the commentators do not really try to explain the mechanics behind the sthis, unlike their extensive technical analysis of the mechanisms underpinning siddha and the meditative states. Their commentaries on the sthis are some of the shortest in the text. This certainly suggests that they are writing from a position of scholasticism, agama, rather than claiming to represent any sort of experiential authority, pratyaka, prama, in the matter of sthis. This may very well be the case, but I am not fully convinced by this position. First of all, Patanjali is an intellectual and I find it hard to consider that he has dedicated a fifth of this text just to cater to the silly beliefs of uneducated simpletons. 44 Additionally, there is no indication that the commentators take these these as anything other than literal nor, to my knowledge, has any traditional text or commentary in the entire pre-modern history of the Indic philosophical and literary traditions, whether folk or scholastic, Buddhist, Hindu, or Jain, taken them as anything other than factual. 
but more fundamental than this, all the preceding sutras in this chapter, particularly 3. 13 to 15, precisely do provide the preparatory infrastructure for a metaphysical explanation of the mechanics underpinning the stis. I will argue, therefore, that stis are not only fundamental to the Skya Yoga tradition but are also an inherent and inevitable corollary of its metaphysical presuppositions. I can certainly appreciate the motives behind attempts to rationalize and minimize the centrality of the stis since so much else in the Yoga Sutras has much to offer modern discussions on the psychology and philosophy of mind, but, however uncomfortable to our modern sensibilities, we have no grounds to suppose that Patanjali or the commentators considered the stis to be anything other than literally factual, any more than to suppose that they take the Hindu cosmography of three. 26 to be anything other than literal or factual. Even in 3. 37, where Patanjali speaks disparagingly about the stis, this is not because they are fanciful or imaginary but, on the contrary, precisely because they are considered actually to arise, they are therefore real dangers to the yogi, not imaginary ones. Certainly the commentaries to the sutra take them in this way. Accordingly, this study will attempt to consider not whether these claims are true or fanciful, but rather how they might be construed as fundamental. Fundamental to the knowledge systems in which they are accommodated, in this case, skin metaphysics. In other words, to adopt the method outlined above, one must suspend notions of true and false in a modern scientific sense. I present the ensuing sutras on sthis as they are best conceptualized, in my reading, from the perspective of the presuppositions of schemetaphysics. Obviously, the reader will ultimately decide how to make sense of these claims from within the presuppositions of our modern knowledge systems and worldviews, but for the duration of this discussion, the reader is invited to step out of his or her own metaphysical slash scientific universe and enter into the world of the accomplished yogi as I have understood Patanjali and our commentators to conceive of it. We thus embark on a phenomenological engagement with the stis. The ingredients from Patanjali's own sutras relevant to a discussion on the metaphysical analysis of the stis are as follows. 1. The gross physical elemental makeup and qualities of any object in reality are essentially a transformation of the tanmatras, which, in turn, are a transformation of the gwas. 3. 44. The first EVOLUTES from the Gwas are Budhai and Ahakra in the Skya Schema, Skya Karika XXIV, XXV, a schema accepted by Yoga in I. 17 and throughout. Thus Budhai and Ahakra, that is to say Siddha, are the immediate substratum of the ten matras. 2. By sheer concentration, the Yogi can penetrate the subtle substructure of any material object of meditation, experiencing it, in the Savakara state, as raw tanmatra energy that transcends the limitations of time and space, in other words, attain an experience of external reality that is cosmic in scope, I. 44. This is an experience of the object, not merely a perception, as all distinctions of subject, object, and process of knowing dissolve, and the object alone stands forth, I. 43, 3, 3, 3, the yogi can penetrate even this tanmatra substratum and experience subtler constitutional dimensions of the object, that is, experience its subtler, more sattvic, nature of ahakra, then of buddhai, and finally of its ultimate nature as prakti, I. 45, 4, the yogi can experience the subtlest level of not just an object of meditation but also the entirety of prakti, I. 40, 44. 5. These types of meditative practices culminate in omniscience, 3. 49. Metaphysically, omniscience means that, since the mind is potentially omnipresent in yoga, when it regains the ability to manifest this nature in the higher states of samadhi, it can pervade the entirety of prakti and as a consequence be aware of every atomic detail within prakti, I. 40. 6. 
The previous sutras have laid the groundwork for this section on sthis by indicating that the change in an object's visible characteristics the dharma, lekha, and avastha of three. 13 ff are nothing other than surface, level transformations of the substratum of prakti, the dharman, which, as noted, the yogi can permeate entirely with his or her own siddha, I. 40. From these points I deduce a hermeneutical principle that I hold as fundamental to understanding how these these might be accepted as physically possible by minds as rational as Patanjali, as also the Buddha and almost all pre-modern. Pre-modern Indic thinkers. Specifically, external gross perceivable matter in essence consists of subtler matter, and this of subtler matter still, etc. All of which inska is ultimately nothing other than a combination of three gwas. 45 This preparatory metaphysical information is the rationale behind the previous verses being situated prior to the section on sthis, the characteristics, state, and condition of objects in external reality of 3. 13 ff are nothing other than permutations of the dharman, the substratum. Since Buddhai is the most subtle dharman substructure after the ragwas of prakti themselves, it is in a position to manipulate or determine the nature of all effects emanating from it. If, in schemetaphysics, the yogi s buddhai is potentially all, pervading in the higher samadhi states and can thus permeate all prakti, I. 40, this can only mean that it merges with the buddhai substructure underpinning all reality. 46 In other words, the yogi is held to be able to transcend the limitations limitations of the klesas and the ahakra, which have restricted or localized or, better, individualized a portion of the universal buddhai into the personal buddhai of the adept, and thereby merge into the cosmic buddhai. This means it is now in a position to manipulate the external effects emanating from buddhai. Thus, by manipulating the substructure one can change the nature of the physical products made of that substructure. Koelman has sensed this principle, it is more puzzling to understand how concentration leads, not only to the psychological perfection of exhaustive intuition, but even to the acquisition of supernormal powers. But if then a yogi has realized a high degree of concentration, could not the psychological aspect of the three was metamorphose itself into its physical aspect? Since prakritic nature is, in its entirety, one single substance working for the liberation of the selves, it does not seem Strange that, in proportion that the yogi approaches the final goal, property nature loses its hold on him and he gains control over it. 1970, 242-43, again, our challenge here is not whether any of this is factually true from the perspective of modern scientific principles, but to acknowledge the centrality of sthis to the yoga tradition and consequently to consider how these sthis might be construed within the contours of schemetaphysics. To illustrate this metaphysics in a manner relevant to the discussion on sthis, let us imagine an alien being on some other planet, who, due to the planet's climate, has never seen water but only ice. We take a chunk of ice with which the alien is familiar and rearrange its atomic substructure by applying heat to it, pervading it with this subtle energy of heat, such that it, to the alien, mysteriously completely changes its form and becomes water a flowing non-solid entity completely different to perception from the hard, dense physical ice entity known to the alien. We then apply more heat, and the water vanishes into a completely different form, appearing as cloudy, vaporous, non-tangible steam. All we have done is to rearrange the imperceptible but consistent substructure of the ice, its hydrogen and oxygen atoms, such that the external forms produced from them appear magically transformed. It is a parallel manipulation of psychic substructure principle that is to be kept in mind when considering the sthis from the framework of ski cosmology. With this metaphysical preamble in place, we can now turn our attention to these sthis. In the present sutra, Patanjali states that when Sayama, which we recall involves practicing dra, dhyana, and samadhi simultaneously, is performed on the characteristics, conditions, and states of manifest reality, 3. 13. The Yogi Develops the ability to understand the past, Atthita, and the future, Anagata. 
The previous discussions have made it clear that the past and the future are inherent in the present. The present is the effect of the past as well as the cause of the future. Thus, by perfectly understanding objects in the present, in terms of their characteristics, conditions, and states, the yogi is believed automatically to understand the past that produced them and the future that they, in turn, will produce. Such clarity, Bhojaraja states, is inherent in the pure nature of the sattvic mind when freed from the obstructive interference of Thomas. Harry Harananda points out that everyone has some ability to predict effects from causes and causes from effects. Whatever jokes we make about weather forecasting, in principle at least, the weather of the next few days is forecast daily based on present meteorological causes, and the present weather is understandable from past conditions. Forecasters would likely hold that. Any mistakes stem from insufficient knowledge of all the variable causes, not from the essential principle of cause and effect itself. Likewise, economists predict cycles based on present economic indicators and explain present conditions by past financial activity. Even on the most basic level, mothers can predict that their children will be hyper if they consume too much sugar before bedtime and can understand their change of mood by past causes. The common denominator in these and numerous other spheres is that the more one studies and concentrates on a phenomenon, the more insight one develops as to its causes and effects. The power of prediction here is essentially an extension of these principles, by Sayama on the characteristics, conditions, and states of the present, the yogi can perceive its causes as well as the effects it will produce. This is another way of saying that such a yogi is able to determine the past and predict the future. Vijanabhiku and other commentators make it clear right from the start of the following section on sthis that the practices discussed in the remainder of this chapter, and the supernormal powers that ensue from them, are not to be performed by those desirous of liberation but only by those desiring power. 3. 37. Those desirous of liberation should perform sayama only on the distinction between purua and prakti, the real goal of liberation. Indic traditions in general are very clear that powers can distract the yogi from the ultimate goal and embroil the practitioner again in sasra since, after all, powers are simply extensions of sensual or physical capabilities. Desiring powers, then, is a more ambitious reenactment of the material predicament, namely, desiring to enjoy prakti and her possibilities, bhagatu. 18, and desiring to enjoy prakti on any level, even through supernormal powers, is the cause of the material bondage of Purua. Consequently, real yogis neither aspire for such powers nor, if, they possess them as unsought by, products of their practices, display them for cheap adulation. 3. 17 Sabdartha, Pratyayana Mitardarad Hyasat Sakaras Tad, Pravibhaga, Sayamth Sarva, Buddha, Ruta, Jainanam Sabda, word, Artha, meaning, object, Pratyayanam, of the idea, Itardara, one with the other, at Hyasat, superimposition, imposing, Sa, Kara, mixing together, confusion, Tad, there, Pravibhaga, distinctions, separation, Sayamt, from Sayama, Sarva, all, Buddha, creatures, Ruta, cries, sounds, jnanam, knowledge due to the correlation between word, meaning, and idea, confusion ensues. By performing sayama on the distinction between them, knowledge of the speech of all creatures arises. Here, too, the commentators take the opportunity afforded by the sutra to write profuse commentaries outlining the understanding of language according to the yoga school. There were various competing streams of thought on the topic of language in ancient India, one of which is the Svoa, Veda, subscribed to by Patanjali here, and outlined by his commentators. 47 As an aside, although Patanjali himself does not use the term, the Yoga school is the only school that accepts the Svoa theory of the grammarian school of philosophy, which lends some credibility to the view that Patanjali the author of the sutras, and Patanjali the grammarian could have been one and the same. 48 First of all, Patanjali notes in the sutra that there is a distinction between a word, sabda, 
its meaning or the object that it denotes, artha, and the idea or knowledge of the object that it creates in the mind, pratyaya. A pratyaya is the specific content of the mind at any given moment an image of the book one is holding, for example a term that overlaps in meaning with vitti, although vitti is more the state of mind within which the pratyaya might occur the state of right knowledge or error or whatever, as discussed in I. 10. Sabda, when manifest as the audible aspect of a word, is, in and of itself, simply an arrangement of sounds or phonemes, which contains meaning of some object, artha, that produces an impression on the mind of the listener, and an utterance a string of such words. Therefore, the word is one thing, the meaning or object itself something else, and the idea or knowledge of the object something else again. The Putanjali who authored the great commentary, the Mabya, on Pinyas grammar raises the question as to what constitutes speech by using the example of the word ga, which, when uttered, gives rise to the idea or knowledge of an animal possessing, in India, tulap, tail, hump, hooves, and horns. His concern was to establish that meaning or knowledge is the primary ingredient in what constitutes a word that is, a word is more than just the series of letters or sounds, contra the MMA with Macron essay with Macron view, critiqued by our commentators here, which holds that a word is simply the series of letters irrespective of whether meaning is construed from them or not. This inherent meaning, bearing aspect of a word is its sphoa, which will be discussed further below. Now, while the word for cow, ga, consists of the string of sounds g, o, the actual animal grazing in the pasture is quite another thing an actual living being with physical shape and form. And the idea or knowledge of a cow that forms in the mind of a listener who hears the word ga is still something else again it is merely a mental impression or image, a pratyaya or vitti made of siddha, quite different from the real, life, flesh, and blood creature out there in the pasture made of gross elements, and different again from a string of sounds in words such as ga, which may differ depending on pronunciation and other variables. Thus word, meaning, and idea are not identical and may cause confusion, says Patanjali in the Sutra, that is, in common usage, these three entities are merged or identified together as if they were one. To explain the next part of the Sutra dealing with Sayama and the ability to understand the speech of all creatures, the commentators embark on a discussion of Sphoa theory. By the manipulation of air in the speaker's mouth, the organ of speech articulates the sound or set of sounds, such as those in the word G, O, which then vibrate in the air and move toward the hearer's organ of ear, the eardrum, which receives the sounds of the word uttered. Sounds have the potential of expressing all objects, as red, yellow, and blue have of manifesting all colors, it is only their particular sequence that determines which specific object the speaker intends to convey. As each sound of a word is uttered, an impression or trace is left on the mind even though the sound fades away. As the last sound is uttered, the memory connects the saskras or imprints of the syllables, and the mind construes meaning from the entirety of the impressions of the phonemes. Up to this point, the enterprise has been sonic sound vibration, funny but once received by the ear, the word manifests its meaning in the mind of the hearer, which is a function of the mind, and not of sound. Thus, the image or idea of a cow arises in the siddha of the listener. The various schools of Indian philosophy theorized over what causes this jump or transformation from word as sound the vibration of air to word as meaning or mental image, a pratyaya, or vitti, in the siddha. How is meaning construed from this jumble of sounds. Is meaning inherent in the sounds themselves, or is it something separate? According to the Sphoa view, a meaning, bearing word, sabda, is an autonomous and permanent entity, which is made manifest through physical sounds, dvani, but independent from them. The dvani sounds are transitory and they succeed each other. For example, the word g, o, cow, is not a single physical entity whose sounds coexist and form a single unit, at the instant that O is pronounced, the G has already disappeared and the final is yet to be uttered. Therefore, meaning cannot be considered to be signified by any individual sound, 
such as G, since otherwise uttering the other letters would be redundant, and G occurs in numerous different words such as Gaura. Nor can meaning be associated with the entire group of sounds, since each one has already disappeared before the next one is uttered they are not pronounced at the same time and thus they cannot coexist in an entirety. Consequently, there must be something else that underpins and unites these letters such that a meaning can be produced from them. This is considered to be the sfoa, the permanent meaning, bearing aspect of the word. A word or meaning signifier, sabda, is called sfoa, because a meaning, artha, bursts forth, sfwaiti, from it. The important point is that the meaning, bearing sfoa is a whole undivided entity, and thus different from the sounds of words, which consist of parts, g, o, contains three parts. The sfoa is thus a connected but different entity from the sounds that reveal it. It pre-exists and is autonomous. The competing school of Varabda would say that meaning comes out of the total of the phonemes, varas, and although these varas are eternal, meaning is not contained in a separate internal entity, as in sfoa, but the sum of the individual external phonemic parts, the varas, when pieced together in the mind. Let us consider the word letter, box, for example. The mind cannot construe meaning from the first phoneme only, since le, could refer to leg, left, length, and so many other things. The same holds true for the syllable let. Letter could refer to a letter of the alphabet or a piece of mail, and even letter, bow is still not clear as it could refer to letter boy, letter bomb, etc. It is only when the final x is added that the sequence of sounds is united by the mind and meaning instantly emerges in a sudden burst or flash, producing a mental image of pratyaya in the siddha of what the word represents. Sphoa can thus be considered as the internal innate expressiveness of the word as a meaning, bearer. This meaning is manifest externally through the uttered sounds, which are perceived by the organ of hearing, but both of these serve only to manifest the inner sphoa. The letters, varas, or sounds, dvanis, are only the outer garment covering the meaning, bearing word, which is distinct from the phonemic clothing in which it is garbed, and the ear is simply the instrument that receives it. By Sayama on the distinction between the word, its meaning, and the idea it produces, Patanjali informs us here, one gains knowledge of the speech of all creatures. We can recall, from I. 18, that the yoga school subscribes to the view that words are eternally connected with their reference, signifiers to their signs. We need not let the transcendent aspect of Svoa detain us here except in order to understand this the outlined in the sutra. One thing that helps us try to uncover the metaphysical suppositions underpinning this the is that, as we know, the letters or phonemes of a word serve as the vehicles through which the pre-existing meaning or idea of the object in question, inherent within as the Svoa, can be made manifest. Thus, in principle at least, although in conventional communication an understanding of a speaker's meaning is dependent on the listener's knowledge of the language used, from the yoga perspective, the advanced yogi is able to perform sayama on any sequence of sounds and gain access to the meaning and idea present as the Svoa embedded within even if the language is not known. This, according to the commentators, would appear to include the sounds of any creature, which, one might suppose, are simply different types of sound combinations animals use to convey meaning, that is, represent some eternal sfoa being expressed. Since these sounds are the external phonemic expressions of a particular object or image in the speaker's or creature's mind, and this object or image is actually present as the internal meaning of the sounds in the form of the autonomous sfoa, the yogi can perform sayama upon sounds and uncover the original sfoa underpinning them. Put differently, he or she can retrieve the inner meaning of the word from its outer encasement in the audible sounds of a word, and thus one can understand the meaning and idea behind the speech of any person or creature, even if sounds represent an unknown language. Performing sayama on sound allows the yogi's mind, which is so intensely and exclusively absorbed in the sound, to penetrate the outer physicality of sound and encounter its inner metaphysical reality of sfoa. Alternatively, 
Harry Harananda understands the mechanics of this sthi as the yogi being able to trace sounds back to the vocal cords of the speaker, and from there proceed onto the speaker's mind. As an aside, the yogi is believed to also be able to pervade the mind of any being directly, not just through the medium of an uttered sound, but this will be discussed in a later sutra. 49. 3. 18 Saskra, S.A. with Makron K.A. with Makron T. Karat Purva, Jiti, Jainanam Saskra, Mental Impression, S.A. with Makron K.A. with Makron T. Before one's eyes, making evident, Karat, by making, Purva, previous, Jiti, births, Jainanam, knowledge by bringing previous Saskras into direct perception comes the knowledge of previous births. The Yogi's ability to perceive previous births, Purva, Jiti, Jainanam, has already been touched upon in 2. 39, and this sthi is taken up again in the sutra, which states that accomplished yogis can access the stock of karma accumulated from previous lives, that is to say, the stock of saskra stored in their siddhas, by performing sayama on them. According to the commentators, saskras act in various ways, they are the cause of memories, they are the cause of afflictions, ignorance, ego, attachment, aversion, and clinging to life, 50 and they are responsible for the fruits that accrue from any and all activities of vice and virtue, karma. In other words, activity, karma, is performed and is recorded as saskra, just as sound can be recorded on a tape recorder or an image on a film. When the conditions are appropriate, these saskras bear fruit and produce the results of karma, type of birth, longevity, and life experience, too. 13. Since, according to yoga psychology, saskras are recorded in their original context, that is, embedded with all the clusters of saskra imprints of the time and place of origin in which they were performed, the yogi can reactivate them as memories and attain knowledge of the details of all previous births. Yogis are held to be able to obtain knowledge of the previous births of others by the same process. This the, like the others in this section, is Pan, Indic. According to Avyavas Buddha, Karita Hagiography, on the evening of his enlightenment, the Buddha, having attained supreme mastery in all the techniques of Dhyana, meditation, during the first watch of the night, remembered the succession of his previous births. He recalled that indeed, I had been such and such a person in such and such a place, and falling at death from that situation, came into this other situation. 14. 2 to 3, 51 furthermore, in the second watch of the night, he saw the births and deaths of all creatures, in accordance with their deeds. 9. This is a standard motif in ancient India, Mahavira, the contemporary of the Buddha in the Jain tradition, knew and saw all conditions of the world, of gods, men, and demons, whence they come, whither they go, whether they are born as men or animals or become gods or hell, beings, Kalpa, Sutra 120.1. Vyasa uses this sthi to make a greater point in the story of the yogi Jagavya, who could directly perceive all his saskras from the previous ten cosmic cycles. Once, another sage, Vyasa, who generally roamed about in his subtle body, assumed a gross physical form so as to put some questions to him. He asked Jagavya whether he had experienced more pain or more pleasure in his numerous births among gods and humans. Even though Jagavya had been able to preserve a pure sattvic mind and avoid the influence of Rajas and Thomas during his myriad births, he replied without hesitation that, in resonance with two. 15. He considered all his experiences, whether among humans or gods, to be nothing but suffering, even though he had also experienced the suffering of life as an animal as well as of life in hell with which to make comparisons. Vaya then queried whether Jagavya's yogic control over Prakti and the happiness he experienced from the contentment resulting from his sattvic disposition should also be included under the category of suffering. The happiness of contentment, he replied, is so called only in comparison to what passes as the pleasure of the senses, but when compared to the bliss of ultimate liberation, even the relative happiness of sattva is ultimately also nothing but suffering, since it, too, 
belongs to the realm of Prakti and the three Gwas. Vijanabhika compares this to rice pudding mixed with both honey and poison. The honey of contentment resulting from the avoidance of Rajas and Tamas is mixed with the poison ensuing from Purua's involvement with Prakti, even if this involvement is with pure sattva. As Putanjali informed us in 2. 15, for the wise, all is suffering. 3. 19 Pratyayajya Para, Siddha, Jainanam Pratyayajya, from the ideas, Para, of others, Siddha, of the minds, Jainanam, knowledge from their ideas, one can attain knowledge of others' minds. This sutra is understood differently by different commentators. Vaikaspati Misra and Pojaraja read it as indicating that by performing sayama on other people's pratyaya's ideas, notions, and mental images one can attain an understanding of their minds, Siddha, Jainanam. Pojaraja states more specifically that by performing sayama on a person's facial countenance and expression, a yogi can understand the person's state of mind. Obviously, Anyone can do this to some extent one can detect fear, or desire, or anger from a person's facial expressions, so this sthi would seem to be an extension of this ability. Vijanabhiku and Hariharananda, however, read this sutra as indicating that by sayama on one's own mind, one can then understand other people's minds. One is reminded of the Buddha's reference to the siddha described here. In Pali Buddhist sources, the state of Sito Pariyaya with Makrana allows the adept to know the minds of other beings by penetrating them with his own mind. He knows the greedy mind as greedy, and so on. 52 3. 20 NACA Tats Lambanata Sivi Ib Tatv NA, Nod, CA, and Tad, that knowledge, SA, with, Alambanam, support, object, Tasia, of it, AV Ib Tatv because of not being the object that knowledge is not accompanied by its object, since this object is not the object of the yogi's mind. Continuing the topic of the previous verse, Patanjali here adds that while the yogi may be able to perceive the emotional state of mind of others, he or she may not necessarily be aware of the object, alambana, causing that state of mind. The yogi may be able to read someone's amorous state of mind, for example, says Vyasa, but not necessarily know who the beloved is, or perceive fear in someone's mind but not the tiger who caused it. This, says Vyasa, is because the object of the other person's mind has not been the object of the yogi Sayama, only the other person's emotion or state of mind has been subject to this. Other commentators, however, are aware that this seems to conflict with the discussion in the previous sutra, where it is stated that Saskras can be accessed only in their context, this should suggest that the yogi should have access to the context of the other person's state of mind the object of emotion or fear, as well as the emotion itself, since this would be imprinted as an image on the Siddha. One might infer that if the yogi wishes to access the actual object causing the other person's state of mind, Sayama would have to be directed to that object specifically. 3. 21 Kaya, Rupa, Sayam Tad, Krahaya, Sakti, Stamhi Kaykyuprak Samprayaj Antart Hanam Kaya, of the body, Rupa, form, Sayamt, by performing Sayama, Tad, that, Krahaya, to be grasped or known, Sakti, power, Stamhi, on the obstruction, Kaku, I, Prakasa, light, Asamprayaj, on the absence of contact, Andrad Hanam, invisibility. By performing Sayama on the outer form of the body, invisibility is attained. This occurs when perceptibility is obstructed by blocking contact between light and the eyes. The commentators are not very detailed in their explanations of the skin metaphysics underlying the sutra. Vaikaspati Misra states that a body can be seen because it has color. Rays of light strike this and the body becomes visible to the eyes of others. Apparently, by Sayama, the yogi can obstruct this process such that he or she is no longer visible to others, even in broad daylight. The same process of obstruction can be applied to sound, touch, taste, and smell. 
The exact mechanics underpinning this ability to stop light refracting off one's body are left unexplained by our traditional commentators, but Tamni, a yogi scholar who wrote an engaging commentary of the sutras, suggests the modus operandi of this sthi is that the body is visible due to the tanmatra or subtle element of form, rupa. 53. As we know, the gross visible elements are transformations of the tanmatra subtle elements. By manipulating the tanmatra of form, the yogi can prevent light bouncing back off it to the eye of the receiver. The Buddha is reputed to have used this sthi to vanish after giving discourses in various assemblies of nobles. 54 If we look at the evolution of the tattvas on the skit chart in the introduction, we see that form, visibility, and sight emanate from the tanmatra of touch, when the tamasic component is increased. One might suppose, then, that the yogi is believed to be able to reverse this, that is, minimize the tamasic element that allows sight, or, put differently, maximize the translucent sattvic element, such that light rays do not have a sufficiently dense, tamasic, surface to bounce back to an observing eye, in the same way that air and ether cannot be perceived due to their relatively higher proportion of sattva. As always, mind is the substratum of grosser energy that evolves from it, so just as the interaction of hydrogen and oxygen molecules can cause ice to revert to water and then to steam, mind can manipulate the density of the elements that emerge from it, an explanation in accordance with yoga metaphysics. In support of this explanation, we can note that Vyasa, in 3.45, speaks of invisibility being attained by the yogi covering himself in the element of ether. 55.3. 22 So Pakrama Nira Pakrama Ca Karma Tad, Sayamd Aparanta, Jainanam Ari Piavasa, with, Yupakramam, approaching, beginning, fruition, near, without, Yupakramam, fruition, ca, and, karma, action, tad, these, samayamat, by performing sayama, apparentat, death, jainanam, knowledge, arabia, by omens, portents, va, or karma is either quick to fructify or slow. By sayama on karma, or on portents, knowledge of one's death arises. This sutra divides karma according to whether or not it is quick to fructify, yupakramam. Vyasa compares karma that is quick to fructify to a wet cloth spread out nicely, which dries quickly, and karma that is not quick to fructify to a wet cloth twisted and bunched up, which dries slowly, or to fire that when fueled by the wind burns dry hay stacked in one place quickly, as opposed to fire that, when the hay is spread out in different places, burns more slowly. In either event, whenever it is due to fructify, the yogi can access the stock of personal karma and, through the process of sayama, understand when its fruition will take place. Karma, we recall, 2. 13, in addition to type of birth and life experience, determines longevity. So through knowledge of one's karma and its fructification the saskras, once again one can determine one's moment and circumstance of death, Apparentat, Jainanam. This is basically the same process mentioned in 3. 18 involved in the understanding of one's previous births. Here, too, Buddhist sources assign this sthi to the Buddha, who predicted his own death three months in advance, 56 a motif that is not uncommon in hagiographical literature. An alternative process for understanding one's impending death is noted by Patanjali here through Port Ents, Arabia. The commentaries speak of three types of portents, personal, those associated with other beings, and those associated with divine beings. Examples of personal portents are not hearing any sound when one blocks one's ears which should otherwise normally produce the sound of fire burning within, says Vijanabhiku, a sound made by one's pra, adds Pojaraja, or not seeing any light when one blocks one's eyes. According to these criteria, one not experiencing these effects is nearing death. Examples of portents heralded by other beings are seeing the messengers of Yama, the lord of death, or unexpectedly seeing one's departed ancestors. Examples of portents involving divine beings are unexpectedly seeing the celestial realms or its denizens, 
or seeing things contrary to what the yogi has been seeing throughout life. By means of any of these portents one is informed of impending death. Dhojaraja states that anyone can be made aware of impending death through such portents, although such information will be vague and not precise with regard to exact specifics such as timing. Yogis adept in the practices indicated in the sutra, in contrast, can see the time and place of their own death precisely, like something visible before their very eyes. The purpose of gaining knowledge of one's death from a yogic perspective, says Akara, is to provoke urgency in fulfilling one's human obligations in not frittering away one's life in other words, to take up yoga seriously and seek liberation. 3. 23 Matri, Dayu Balani Matri, Friendliness, Dayu, etc. Balani, strength by Sayama on friendliness and such things, strengths are acquired. The commentators understand friendliness and such things in this sutra to refer to I. 33, where Matri, friendship, Karu, compassion, Mudita, joy, and Upek, equanimity were listed by Patanjali. By cultivating friendship toward those who are happy, as prescribed in that sutra, and performing Sayama on this feeling, the yogi attains what Vyasa terms the power of friendliness. He becomes the well, wisher of all, say the commentators, can make the whole world happy, and his effort to win the friendship of others will not be in vain. He destroys all envy and hatred from his heart, says Hari Harananda, becomes completely free from malice and harshness, and no thoughts of harming others ever darken his heart, such that all people, whether malicious or not, find him to be a source of comfort and friendship. Likewise, by performing Sayama on the feeling of compassion that the yogi is prescribed to cultivate toward those in distress, I. 33, the power of compassion arises. He can lift the suffering out of their pain, says Vekaspati Misra. By Sayama on joy toward the pious, one attains the power of joyfulness. The commentators note, however, that Sayama is not directed toward the fourth prescription listed in I. 33 Equanimity toward the sinful because equanimity is not a specific feeling but an absence of other feelings, Sayama would thus seem to require a distinct state of mind as an object of focus, otherwise the meditator has nothing on which to focus. Essentially, the mechanics of this type of Sayama seem to be that through the sheer intensity of total absorption on a feeling such as those listed above, the siddha of the yogi becomes so completely pervaded and charged with that feeling that it emanates out and affects other people. This is just an extension of commonly experienced principles, laughter, for example, can be contagious, as can sadness, anger, or other emotions. As we have seen, the principle of Sayama simply enhances and expands on these occurrences. All feelings, after all, are potentially inherent in Siddha the mind is the seat of emotion. So through Sayama the mind simply manifests what is latent within it. 3. 24 Bailau Hasti, Baladini Bailau, on the power, strength, Hasti, elephant. Bala, strength, Adini, etc. By practicing Sayama on strengths, the yogi attains the strength of an elephant, etc. Here, Two, the commentators are curd. By Sayama on the strength of an elephant, Bailau Hasti, the yogi acquires such strength. By Sayama on Garuda, Vyu's eagle carrier, one gets the power of Garuda. By Sayama on the power of the wind, one gets such powers, and so on. The principle seems to be that by the yogi's intense concentration on any power, such as the strength of an elephant, his mind can manifest that same power in his body. Once again, everything is potential in the mind, and mind, siddha, is the substratum of all evoluts, including strength. It can therefore potentially manifest anything at all, since everything inherently exists in latent form within its own nature. Koelman expresses this in his usual profoundly precise way, man's individual body and mind are only superficially and relatively relatively individual substances, fundamentally they are only energizations and self, differentiations of and within proctic nature itself, 
which is the sole genuine substance. Man, therefore, through his perctic organism, is in communication, is one with proctic nature in its universality, 1970, 241. 3. 25 Pravtaloka, Nyasatskma, Vyavahita, Vipraka, Jnanam Pravti, Cognition, Higher Sense Activity, Alaka, Light, Nyasat, by directing, Skma, Subtle, Vyavahita, Concealed, Vipraka, Remote, Jnanam, Knowledge by directing the light of cognition, one obtains knowledge of subtle, concealed, and remote things. Vijanabhiku suggests that the yogi becomes so powerful that, even without performing sayama, just by directing his or her mind toward an object, even if it is subtle, skma, concealed, vayavahita, or far away, vipraka, it becomes revealed just as one has immediate perception of a nearby pot merely by directing one's eyes to it. This, say the commentators, is because when all traces of Rajas and Tamas have been eradicated, the natural luminosity inherent in the sattva of the Siddha becomes manifest without hindrance. This light can then be directed toward revealing things beyond normal cognition the subtle, concealed, and remote things of the sutra. The senses, too, become keener in their operation, as the Jita puts it, luminosity manifests in all the gates of the body, 14. 11. One might add that Siddha in Yoga metaphysics is potentially all, pervading when its Rajasic and Tamasic potentials are suppressed. Thus, when fully sattvic and focused, it can bypass or transcend the senses and contact objects beyond the normal reaches of the senses. Let us consider this from the perspective of skin metaphysics. Let us say a Purua, enveloped in its Siddha as all Sasric Puruas are, takes birth as an ant. The awareness of the Purua or, more precisely, the Vitas of the Purua as Siddha, is limited to the contours of the ant's body and sensual range, due to its klesas as per the definitions of Avidya and Asmita outlined in 2. 5 to 6. Now, suppose the ant dies and, due to its particular karmic destiny, next takes birth as an elephant. Its Asmita now identifies with a new instrument, such that the Vitas produced by it pervade a much larger surface the body and sensual range of an elephant. This indicates that the range of Siddha can expand and contract. What, then, is to prevent it expanding farther still? Like the light of a small bulb, which could, in principle, continue to emanate out throughout the entire universe were there no obstacles to obstruct it, Siddha is potentially all, pervading, as is the source awareness of Purua, Siddhi, Sakti, were there no klesas to obstruct it. Once the klesas are eliminated, then, one can see how the internal logic of skin metaphysics requires the Siddha to be all, pervading and thus, from the perspective of the Sutra, able to be aware of anything within Prakti, which is another way of conceptualizing omniscience. This basic theme will be repeated throughout this chapter. The Jains have an interesting counterpart to these ideas. In Jain metaphysics, the soul's inherent omniscience, which is another way of saying omnipresence, is covered by the obstructing limitations of karma. 57 When these karmic obstacles are partly destroyed, the yogi develops supernormal sensory abilities, of the Jainanam, when psychological obstacles such as hatred and envy have been overcome, the yogi can know the minds of others, mana, paridaya, jainanam, and when. All karmic obstructions have been completely removed, omniscience ensues, kevala, jainanam. 3. 26 bhavna, jaina suryi sayam bhavna, regions, worlds, jainanam, knowledge, suryi, on the sun, Sayamt, by Sayama by performing Sayama on the sun arises knowledge of the different realms in the universe. A lengthy description of the Puric concept of the universe is given in the commentaries for the Sutra. There are seven Lokas, worlds, or realms, in Hindu cosmography. This world with all its creatures is one, and above it is space with the stars, followed by a series of celestial realms. The first realm is the abode of Indra, king of the gods, 
and above this the abode of the Prajaptis, the progenitors. The threefold realm of Brahma, the secondary creator 58 Janaloka, Tapoloka, and Satyaloka is above these. There are also seven nether regions or lower realms below the earth, as well as seven hells where beings live long and painful lives experiencing the negative karma accrued by their impious deeds. Harry Harananda states that entities here have active minds but do not have gross bodies, and thus suffer the torment of not being able to fulfill their desires, like ensnared beasts. Sojourns in hell, however, are never eternal but last only until the specifics of an individual's negative karma have been accounted for and borne their due fruits. The earth realm or region consists of seven islands in the center of which is the Golden Sumeru, also known as Meru, mountain. Its peaks are made of silver, emerald, crystal, gold, and jewels. As a result of the reflection from these peaks, the sky in the south is deep blue, in the east, white, in the west, clear, and in the north, golden. The sun revolves around Sumeru, causing day and night, and on the right of this mountain is the Jambu tree, which is why the earth is known as Jambadvipa. Jambadvipa consists of nine continents. There are three mountains to the north of Meru, surrounding three continents, Vara, consecutively, and three mountains to the south, surrounding three more continents, in addition to which, there is a continent to the east of Meru, one to the west, and one more, the ninth, below Meru. Jambadvipa stretches out a distance of 50 Yojanas 59 in all directions from Meru and is thus 100 Yojanas in circumference in its entirety. It is surrounded by a salt ocean twice its size. After this there are six islands, Dvipas, in succession, each one surrounded by oceans of different liquids sugarcane juice, liquor, ghee, curd, milk, and sweet rice. These are encircled by the Lokaloka mountain range. This entire universe is situated within an egg-like case. Despite its enormity, it is merely a spark of prakti, like a firefly in the sky. In these worlds, oceans, and mountains live a variety of gods and celestial beings. The mortals and gods who reside in the islands are pious beings they gain residency in these realms as a result of good karma performed in the past. Various parks are found on Mount Meru, which are the pleasure grounds for the gods. The assembly hall of the gods is also there, along with the city of the gods and their palace. In Indra's realm, the first of the five realms, there are six types of resident gods who have all the mystic powers, such as living for immense lifespans, an entire Kalpa 60, the ability to fulfill their desires merely by thought, enjoying the pleasures of sex, and they are begotten without parents, in other words, sex is not inconvenienced by pregnancy. The five classes of gods who inhabit the Prajapti realm have mastery over the material elements, which, says Vekaspati Misra, means that they can manipulate them at will, subsist on meditation alone, do not require gross pyrktic foodstuffs as their bodies are made of ten matra, the subtle evolutes of prakti, and live a thousand times longer than the residents of Indra's realm. The four types of gods in Brahma's realm of Janaloka live even longer than this, the lifespan of each of the four types doubling consecutively, have full control over the elements and sense organs, and also subsist on meditation, as do the celibate residents of Tapoloka. In Satyaloka, the highest celestial realm, one of the four classes of resident gods is absorbed in Savitarka meditation, another in Savakara, another in Ananda meditation, and the fourth in Usmita, CI. 17 on these. These various realms and their inhabitants are described in greater detail in the various Puras, particularly in the Bhagavata Pura, v. 16-26. This entire cosmography can be directly perceived by the yogi performing Sayama on the doorway of the sun, says Vyasa. Some commentators seem to accept this literally, as meditation on the actual sun disk, Suryi, but others, such as Vekaspati Misra and Hari Harananda, take this to be the doorway of the Suun channel in the subtle physiology usually associated with Tantric Yoga. 
61 Harry Harananda notes that this physiology cannot be directly perceived by the eyes, but by meditation, since it is made of subtle elements, and the eyes can perceive only gross elements. When the entrance to the suun is opened, he states, the various regions noted above are revealed. There is thus a correspondence between the microcosm of the body and the macro COSM of the universe. The specific mechanics of how the entire universe can be perceived by the sedentary meditator are not explained by the commentators, but one might suppose that since the entire universe is held to evolve from the first evolute of Prakti, Buddhai, and since one's personal Buddhai is simply an individualization of this original cosmic Buddhai, the yogi is able to transcend the limitations of the individual Buddhai and directly perceive the cosmic Buddhai and all its derivates, such as the various realms of the universe, even when situated motionless in meditation. This perception will thereby appear internal to the yogi. As Hari Harananda puts it, from the perspective of the universal Buddhai, there is no such thing as far or near since Buddhai underpins all its evolutes, it is thus all, pervading and everything is within it. Therefore, the Buddhai of each individual creature, as well as the solar systems, which are evolutes from Buddhai, are indirectly but essentially on the same plane since everything in the universe is a manifestation of the same substratum. The Buddhai of the yogi is supposed to be able simply to pass beyond personal bodily limitations. In any event, this belief is still very much a living tradition. A modern Siddha, yogi, Swami Muthananda, who was primarily responsible for establishing the Siddha tradition in the West in the 1960s, in his remarkable autobiography, Play of Consciousness, claimed to have personally experienced internally internally within himself the various regions of the universe during his own meditations. The purpose of all this cosmological information, says Hari Harananda, is that by visiting all the realms in creation, the yogi is better able to appreciate the greatness of Kavalya liberation. There are frequent warnings in the Puris about yogis being sidetracked from their pursuit of liberation by the wonderful realms of the universes, as early as the Muaka Upaniyad strong language is used to decry the fools who know nothing better, when they have enjoyed their good karma in the higher realms, they return again to this miserable world, I. 2.7 FF The Jita too describes those intent on the celestial realms as full of desires and ignorant, too. 42-43, since the celestial realms up to the realm of Brahma are all places of rebirth, 8. 16. 3. 27 Kandra Terra, Vyaha, Jainanam Kandra, on the moon, Terra, stars, Vyaha, arrangement, Jainanam, knowledge by Sayama on the moon, knowledge of the solar systems. The commentators make no comments here, considering the sutra a sequel to the previous one to be understood in parallel fashion. Whereas Sayama on the sun resulted in knowledge of different realms, worlds, mountains, and oceans, Sayama on the moon, Khandra, results in knowledge of the arrangement of the stars, Terra, Vyaha. Hojaraja notes that the sutra is included separately from the previous one since when the sun is shining, the luster of the stars is not visible, and one can obviously perform Sayama on the moon only when the sun has set. Hari Harananda relates the sutra, too to tantric physiology. 3. 28 Dhruv Tad, Gaudi, Jainanam Dhruv, on the pole star, Tad, there the stars, Gaudi, movement, Jainanam, knowledge by Sayama on the pole star comes knowledge of the movement of the stars. Here, too, the commentators take the sutra to be self-explanatory, but all take the pole star, Dhruva, to refer to the celestial body and not some aspect of the subtle physiology. By Sayama on the pole star, says Pojaraja, the yogi can distinguish stars from planets and determine when a given heavenly body will be situated in any particular sign of the zodiac. Ikara takes the sutra to refer to astrological science, by understanding the movement of the stars, and how their influences neutralize, enhance, and affect each other. One can determine the good and bad fortunes of living beings. 3. 29 Nabi, Kikurkaya, Vyaha, 
Jane Adam Nobby, Navel, Kicker, On the Wheel, Kaya, Body, Viaha, Arrangement, Jane Adam, Knowledge by Sayama on the Navel Plexus of the Body comes Knowledge of the Arrangement of the Body. Just as one can attain knowledge of different realms by performing Sayama on the Sun, and knowledge of the arrangement of the stars by performing Sayama on the Moon, Patanjali here states that, on a micro level, one can likewise develop intimate knowledge of the physical body, Kaya, Vyaha, by performing Sayama on the navel, Nabi, Kakra that is, one can understand everything about the constituents and inner workings of the body by this means. Vijanabhika compares the navel will to the root of the banana plant from which the entire plant grows. Pojaraja states more specifically that the navel is the root of the Na with Makron S, subtle veins, that pervade the body. Vyasa briefly outlines the understanding of the body according to the traditional medical system of Ayurveda, by now well, known in the West. There are the three doas, usually translated as humors kapha, gas, vata, bile, and pitta, phlegm and seven substances skin, blood, muscle, tendon, bone, fat, and semen each one layered over the previous one. 62 disease in Ayurveda is due to an imbalance in these three doas. The yogi can gain knowledge of any imbalance or malfunctioning in the body by performing the sayama noted in the sutra. And, from a yogic perspective, Vijanabhika points out that by performing sayama on the navel the yogi can perceive the body to be what it really is, a heap of doas and substances. Kakra here is not necessarily a reference to the Kakra physiology most commonly associated with the cluster of Siddha slash Tantra slash Sakta traditions. Tellingly, Patanjali makes no direct reference to this overall physiology in the sutras other than the mention of Na with Makron in 3. 31 below. In fact, classical yoga does not concern itself with this physiology. Some of the commentators do read some of these sutras from the perspective of the Kakras, as we have seen in 3. 26 to 27, but none of the primary commentators makes any mention of, for example, the primary ingredient of Sakta physiology, the Qualin. One might go on to note that the understanding of the goal in classical yoga clearly differs from the Siddha notion that the supreme goal of yoga is attained, and liberation occurs, when this Qualin reaches the thousand, petal Sahasrara, Kakra in the crown of the head. Whatever other references to Kakras are found throughout the commentaries are peripheral to the classical yoga tradition, and, indeed, a peripheral topic in mainstream Hinduism. The cluster of Sakta traditions is distinct from classical yoga in a number of ways. First, they are monistic and yoga is dualistic. The Sakta tradition see Prakti as ultimately pure consciousness, Siddhi, Sakti, 4. 34, thus they are monist in the sense that they hold that all reality both the seer and the seen, Purua and Prakti, of 2. 17 ff is made up of one substance, consciousness. Accordingly, it is not Prakti that is to be transcended, as is the case with yoga, but notions of individual separateness from the supreme deity. Once the Delhi Miting Ego separating the individual Atman from realizing its higher nature as one with the Supreme Atman has been transcended, ultimate Samadhi in the Sakta traditions entails enjoying the spectacle of Prakti as Siddhi, Sakti in its myriad variegations from the liberated vantage point of oneness with the Supreme Deity, most usually associated with Shiva or a form of the Goddess. For the dualistic Yoga tradition, on the other hand, Prakti is not Siddhi, Sakti at all but inert matter obstructing Purua from realizing its own separate and completely distinct nature as Siddhi, Sakti, in Yoga, in other words, Siddhi, Sakti pertains to Purua, not to Prakti. In line with these monistic presuppositions, in the Sakta traditions liberation entails the merging of the individual Atman into a higher, ultimately transpersonal reality, 63 Whereas in yoga there is a plurality of souls who never lose their individuality whether in the liberated state or not. They do not completely merge into one ultimate supreme soul within which personal individuality is ultimately erased, but remain individual purus. Having noted this metaphysical difference, 
one wonders how different the higher states of the two systems are from an experiential point of view. We have noted how sattva is as if conscious due to becoming animated by consciousness. Consciousness, Siddhi, Sakti, reflecting Purua back to itself when all traces of Rajas and Tamas have been made latent. In the higher stages of Samadhi, the Yogi S. Siddha, animated by Siddhi, Sakti, becomes omnipresent and omnipotent due to pervading Prakti in other words, the animated all, pervading Sattvic Siddha of the Yogi can become coextensive with Prakti. All this would appear to be a very similar experience to that reported by the Siddha tradition of enjoying Prakti as Siddhi, Sakti, put differently, the Siddha tradition takes Prakti as Siddhi, Sakti, and Yoga understands it as if Siddhi, Sakti. Moreover, even with regard to the pluralistic versus monistic understanding of liberation in terms of whether there exists a plurality of Atmans at the highest level of truth, or only one, one wonders how much difference there might be between experiencing oneself as the one supreme absolute soul in a monistic system or to be one of a plurality of liberated Atmans who are aware only of their own omnipresent nature and nothing else in a pluralistic system. The yoga tradition after all gives us no indication that the omnipresent Purua in Nirvaja slash Asamprajanata, Samadhi is aware of other omnipresent Puruas, which, to all intents and purposes, points to a monistic experience, even if a plurality of souls are accepted on a metaphysical or scholastic level in principle. Be this as it may, in terms of method, one can reiterate that Samadhi, in Tantra, is attained when Qualin is first awakened by various techniques and then rises up the central Suun channel, piercing the various Kakras along the way and triggering various supernormal sensual experiences until it finally unites with the Sahasrara, Kakra. The, the experiences of Qualin awakening associated with the Sakta traditions are indications of yogic success and can be enjoyed provided one has realized one's oneness with the Supreme Deity. As should be obvious by now, liberation is attained entirely differently in classical yoga, and the Kakra slash Na with Makron slash Qualin physiology is completely peripheral to it although there is overlap in some, but not all, techniques, such as the use of Mantra and Prima. Moreover, and partly as a consequence of this difference in presuppositions, the these are considered accomplishments only for one whose mind is outgoing, that is, who has not attained the Virajya, dispassion, required of yogic practice in I. 15 to 16, they are obstacles to the Samadhi state taught by Patanjali, 3. 37, and ultimately to be discarded as worthless. Thus, whilst the slash Sakta slash Tantra metaphysics is a wonderful and vibrant spiritual universe in its own right, with deep roots in the ancient Indic past, and with its own internal coherence, logic, and appeal, it is not by any means the same as the system being taught by Patanjali. The integrity and distinctiveness of these traditions have a tendency to be erased into a hodgepodge in their western exportations into a kind of kichori. Yoga In India, a typical meal consists of a subji, vegetable dish, dal, lentil soup, rice, chap patty, unleavened bread, and perhaps some other items, each with its own distinct flavorings and spices. After the meal is enjoyed, the leftovers are often combined and served the next day as kichori, at which point all the flavorings are merged together into a homogeneous whole. Similarly, the multiple yogic traditions of India such as Tantra and Classical Yoga, despite their very distinctive features and practices in their traditional settings, tend to be merged into a kichori sort of yoga in many of its western forms. Thus one often finds a generic sort of yoga typically appropriating bits and pieces of Patanjali, type practices as presented here in the sutras but articulated with Neo, Advaita, Vedanta slash Brahman terminologies and flavored with elements from tantric subtle physiology, all blended together as if representing a single coherent homogeneous tradition. This is understandable and with plenty of antecedents in pre-modern Indic traditions themselves one might add 64, indeed, it can be argued that such blending is the very nature of religious traditions, and perhaps inevitable in the modern West. While on this topic, there are a variety of traditions that are clearly influenced by Patanjali, which Larson, 2008, 
calls satellite traditions, that appropriate important aspects from Patanjali while diverging considerably from him in focus, such as the classical Haha Yoga tradition. This, of course, points to the centrality and authoritativeness of Patanjali in yogic practice insofar as his system is incorporated into other systems as a source of legitimacy, but then flavored by the sectarian specifics of these other systems. 3. 30 Kaha, Kyup Kut, Pipasa, Nivti Kaha, Throat, Kyup, Pit, Hollow, Kut, Hunger, Pipasa, Thirst, Nivti, Cessation, Subviewal by Sayama on the pit of the throat comes the cessation of hunger and thirst. Vijanabhika takes the pit of the throat, Kaha, Kupa, to extend from the base of the tongue to the stomach. By Sayama on this spot, yogis can overcome hunger and thirst, Kud, Pipasa, according to Patanjali. No further explanation of how this transpires is provided in our sources, except for Bhojaraja's comment that the sensation of hunger is caused by the contact of pra, vital air, with this place. One might infer that since the sense of touch or sensation is dependent on the quality of air in schematophysics, by manipulating the pro-life air by means of the power of mind that underpins it along the lines outlined. For some of the other sthis, the yogi can control its effects, in this case, the sensation of hunger. 3. 31 Gurm, Na with Makron Ya with Makron M Sterium Gurm, Tortoise, Na with Makron Ya with Makron M, Subtle Channel, Sterium, Steadiness by Sayama on the Subtle Tortoise Channel, Steadiness is attained. Below the pit of the throat, or trachea, says Vyasa, is a particular Na with Makron, or Subtle Channel, shaped like a tortoise, Gurm. As noted, in Tantra Physiology, just as the gross body is pervaded by innumerable blood vessels, there is a subtle network of thousands of subtle channels called Na with Makron S. As early as the Prasna Upaniyad the pro-life airs are held to circulate through the body by means of these Na with Makron S. The yogi can become as steady, sterya, as a snake or an alligator, says Vyasa, by Sayama on the trachea. Again, Although the mechanics behind this the are not explained, the same principles can be inferred, balance is associated with air, so by mentally manipulating the appropriate pra associated with balance in the particular Na with Makron mentioned here by Patanjali, the yogi can remain as immobile as snakes and iguanas. 65 From the overall perspective of yoga, perhaps more to the point is Harry Harananda's observation that if the body becomes immobile, so does the mind. In his commentary to the Sutra, Bhojaraja, too, emphasizes firmness of mind as ensuing from this practice. 3. 32 Murdha, Jitai Siddha, Darsanam Murdha, Head, Jitai, On the Light, Siddha, Perfected Souls, Darsanam, Vision. By Sayama on the Light in the Skull, a vision of the Siddhas, Perfected Beings, is attained. There is an opening in the skull, says Vyasa, that contains radiant light. As the radiance of light inside a house is concentrated in the keyhole, says Bhojaraja, from the perspective of someone standing outside the house, so the luminosity of sattva is concentrated in this opening called the Brahma, Ranra. By performing Sayama on this spot, one has a vision, Darsana, of the Siddhas. Siddhas are perfected beings who possess mystic powers and inhabit the higher realms of the universe. They often move around in the space between the earth and the sky, and can sometimes be contacted by advanced yogis. Again, this too remains a living tradition, in his autobiography, Muttananda claimed to have encountered such beings while in states of samadhi, as did Yogananda in his autobiography of a yogi. 3. 33 Pratiphat V.A. Sarvam Pratiphat, by intuition, V.A., or, Sarvam, everything or, by intuition, comes knowledge of everything. Intuition, Pratipha, says Vyasa, precedes discrimination, the Vivka of 2. 26 to 7, as the light of dawn precedes the light of the sun. The yogi is able to attain knowledge of everything, Sarvam, 
due to the spontaneous rise of intuition, Pradhibha. Vijanabhika defines intuition, Pradhibha, as knowledge that is obtained without a teacher. Ankara states that by intuition the yogi can automatically attain all of the various powers outlined in the previous sutras that are gained by the practice of sayama on individual objects. According to the yoga tradition, intuition is associated with the preliminary phase of omniscience, 3. 36 ff. It is an inherent attribute of pure sattva. 3. 34 hde siddha, save it hde, on the heart, siddha, the mind, save it, knowledge by sayama on the heart, knowledge of the mind ensues. Vyasa calls the heart the city of Brahman, a lotus, like a boat, and the place where the intelligence resides. As noted in the introduction, even though Patanjali himself does not refer to Brahman, the absolute truth of the Upanishads, the commentators here and elsewhere do correlate Brahman and Purua as if this is a perfectly natural thing to do, as indeed it is for any classical Hindu thinker. The heart, Hdaya, is taken to be the abode of the Atman as early as the Prasna Upanishad. 3. 6. Vaikaspati Misra and Pojaraja describe the lotus as facing down, and in so doing again introduce notions of subtle physiology usually associated with the haha, yoga and tantra traditions in which they play a far more central role than in classical Patanjalian yoga, where they are peripheral. There are seven kakras, literally, wheels, or energy centers in the body, and these are usually described as shaped like lotuses. The heart kakra is the middle one and considered to be the seat of intelligence. Thus, both the Atman and the Siddha are centered in the heart. Consequently, by performing Sayama in this region, one comes to know the Siddha mind and its modifications. Vijanabhika notes that the previous powers are minor, insofar as they are peripheral to the real goal of Yoga, which, as Patanjali wasted no time in informing us at the beginning of the entire text, is to still the vitas of the Siddha. The knowledge referred to in the sutra facilitates that goal by giving the yogi direct perception of the workings of Siddha. 3. 35 Sattva, Puruayar Atyant Sakreo Pratyavayo Paga Parathat Vatsvartha, Sayam Purua, Jainanam Sattva, of the intellect, Puruayo, and of the Purua, Atyanta, complete, Asakreo, distinct, Pratyaya, idea, image, notion, avidya, non-distinction, paga, experience, parathatvat, because of having the nature of existing for another, svartha, for itself, sayamt, from sayama, purua, the true self, jainanam, knowledge worldly experience consists of, the notion that there is no distinction between, the purua self and pure intelligence, although these two are completely distinct. Worldly experience exists for another idati, for Purua, by Sayama on that which exists for itself idati, on Purua, comes knowledge of Purua. Patanjali here essentially re-articulates the definition of avidya given in 2. 5. Worldly experience consists of confounding the pure self with the intelligence, which molds itself into the forms and thoughts of this world. As has been discussed repeatedly, Purua, due to ignorance, considers Buddhai and all its permutations to be its real self. In addition to the familiar example of the crystal and red flower, Vijanabhiku has us imagine having soot on one's face. As one can be blissfully unaware that one has soot on one's face, a substance that is completely distinct from one's actual face, so, due to avidya, ignorance, the Siddha is unaware that the source of its awareness Purua, is completely distinct sakra, from the permutations of Buddha, which cover it, so to speak when the intelligence is completely free from the effects of Rajas and Tamas in other words, when Buddha is pure and undisturbed it becomes luminous and clear as we know Rajas and Tamas are the influences that pull Buddhai out into the external world and cause it to mold itself into the external thoughts and forms that have actually nothing to do with pure Purua. As has been discussed, Buddhai, when pure, also acts like a spotless mirror, 
which reflects the face gazing at it without distortion, so to speak. In this luminous state, according to Vijanab Hiku, Buddhai can reflect Purua's real image back to Purua a pure notion or vision of its true nature, rather than the distorted images of the world of Sasra. This sutra is taken to indicate that by Sayama on this notion or image of Purua in the Sattvic Buddhai, awareness of the existence of the real, Purua emerges. 66 We might infer that the reason Patanjali uses the term Sattva rather than Siddha or Buddhai to refer to the mind, is to underscore the fact that, at this point, the mind's sattvic potential is at its maximum, with the other two was in a state of as total latency as the constitutional metaphysical makeup of Prakti will allow. Vyasa hastens to add that this notion of Purua in itself is not ultimate self, realization, since it is still a notion or image in Buddhai which, however pure, is nonetheless a product of Prakti and thus completely distinct from the real Purua. There is a difference between the reflection in a mirror and the actual face gazing into it. Purua, as we know, can know itself only by itself and not through any outside agency, which would involve connection with the world of matter. Vyasa quotes the Bhadrayaka Upanishad, 4. 5.15, here, by who is the knower to be known. In other words, Prakti and its products can be known by Purua, but by what is Purua to be known? The Upanishads are full of verses indicating that the self is higher than the mind or intelligence, sight does not reach there, nor thought nor speech, we don't know it or perceive it so how would one show it? Kinai. 3. Therefore, as the Gita puts it, Atmanyeva Atmana, one revels in the self through its own self, too. 55. 67 Hence the coinage of Neo, Vedantic terms such as self, realization, introduced to the West at the end of the 19th century by Vivekananda and popularized by the Vedanta Society and Paramahansa Yogananda in the 1930s. 68 To summarize, then, while Buddha cannot reveal the actual Purua, it can reveal a pure image or reflection of Purua, Hari Harananda calls this reflection the pure Ahakra or ego, since it reveals the real Aham, I, the Purua self, in contrast to the normal function of Ahakra Asmita, which is to cause misidentification with the false self of body and mind. So while this is not the ultimate goal of yoga, by Sayama on this pure image or reflection the yogi is one step away from Kavalya, complete liberation. When this final and ultimate state manifests, Buddha, and all its images and ideas, including the pure one described here of the actual Purua itself, fade away, leaving Purua with nothing to be aware of except itself. 3. 36 Tata Pradhibha, Ravat, Vedanadar Sasveda, Varda Jayant Tata, from this, Pradhibha, Intuition, Ravat, Hearing, Vedana, Touch, Adarsa, Vision, Asvata, Taste, VA with Makron RTA with Makron, Smell, 69 Jayant, are born from this, Intuition as well as higher hearing, touch, vision, taste, and smell are born. From the type of Sayama noted in the last sutra, the yogi attains the two abilities noted by Patanjali here, intuition, pratibha, and higher sense perception. By intuition, says Vyasa, comes knowledge of the subtle, the separated, the remote, the past and the future, as expressed in 3. 25 in other words, of things normally inaccessible to conventional means of knowledge. By higher sense perception one can continually experience divine sounds, sensations, sights, tastes, and smells. Strengthened by the practice of yoga, the yogi's senses can experience subtler levels of sense objects. Sattva, as we know, becomes much more sensitive, that is, can experience the higher potentials of the senses, when its coverings of rajas and tamas are removed. Pojaraja takes Vyasa's reference here to divine sensations to refer to the sense objects of the celestial realms. According to Vaikaspati Misra, self, realization is impossible until Prakti has revealed herself in her fullness to Purua, and this entails experiencing the subtler dimensions of Prakti. However, 
the Indic yogic tradition in general, as specified by Patanjali in the next sutra, considers all mystic powers, which arise of their own accord even without the yogi desiring them, to be impediments to the goal of yoga, since they pose the risk of distracting the yogi back into sensual, pyrktic, experiences. 3. 37 te samadhav yupasarga vyathain sadeya te, they the powers, samadhav, in samadhi, yupasarg, obstacles, vyathain, rising up, outgoing, sadeya, accomplishments, perfections, powers these powers are accomplishments for the mind that is outgoing but obstacles to samadhi. The terms the perfection or power, which occurs only four times in the sutras, 70 is used here to mean the supernormal powers. For a yogi, the powers noted in the previous sutra hinder the cultivation of samadhi, since they entice the mind back out into the realm of prakti, they cause wonder and pleasure, says Pojaraja, and thus are obstacles, yupasarg, to the attainment of samadhi. But for one whose mind is outgoing, vyathana, that is, interested in the enticements of the world, they appear to be desirable accomplishments. A beggar, says Vaikaspati Misra, may consider even a meager smattering of wealth to be the fullness of riches, but a yogi should not think that these powers, which appear spontaneously, are the goal, and must reject them. For how, he asks, can a genuine yogi take pleasure in things that are obstructions to the real goal of yoga? That this, these are potential impediments to the goal of yoga is a widespread position in Indic traditions, the wise speak of this, these as obstacles, they are the cause of delay to one who is practicing the highest yoga, Bhagavata Pura 11. 15.33 Pensa, 1969 suggests that Patanjali's warning here does not apply to all sthis but only to those in the preceding sutra. Meditative states would be disrupted and consciousness would run the risk of again being caught up in sensory experience upon the unexpected eruptions of the quasi, psychedelic, supernormal sensual experiences indicated in the previous sutra. But not all sthis are detriments to samadhi, after all, Patanjali, I. 35 included supernormal sense experiences as suitable objects for the mind to concentrate on in order to achieve samadhi. Patanjali is thus concerned in the sutra with emphasizing something that is an important technical problem and no more, Ibid. 271 Patanjali is informing the practitioner of experiences that might accrue upon the path so that the yogi will not be confused, distracted, or sidetracked by them. Additionally, Vyasa and Vaikaspati Misra Noted in I. 35 that upon experiencing some of the preliminary truths of yoga, the faith of the genuine yogi will thereby be reaffirmed and the commitment to proceed strengthened. A yogi sidetracked by them has clearly not mastered the Varajya, detachment, required as a preliminary to yoga. I. 12. 3. 38 Bandha, Kra, Sethilyat Prakara, Save dank ca satasya para, or via bandha, of bondage, kra, cause, sethilyat, from the loosening, prakara, conduct, working, passageway, save dant, from knowledge, ca, and, satasya, of the mind, para, others, sarara, body, via, settle in, entering by loosening the cause of bondage, and by, knowledge of the passageways of the mind, the mind can enter into the bodies of others. The mind is restless by nature like a bouncing ball, says Akara, or the constant play of flame in glowing coals but due to the stock of karma, saskras, it becomes limited and trapped in one body and cannot experience existence in other bodies until the present body dies. However, by the cultivation of samadhi, the strength of this karma becomes weakened, sethilya, and knowledge of the workings of the mind arises, prakara, savedana. 72 As a result of these two developments, the yogi can remove his mind from its moorings in his own body and settle it into someone else's body, according to the sutra. The powers of the senses follow the mind in this transference, says Vyasa, just as the swarm of bees follows the queen bee, 
and so the powers of the senses also settle in the new body when the mind settles into it. Just as the entire subtle body, skma, sarara, transfers into a new body at death, so the yogi can enact this transferal while still alive but, in this case, after entering into a new body, with the ability to return into the original body. The ability is so widespread in yogic narrative that white, forthcoming, calls it the sign kwanan of a yogi's practice. Dhojaraja reminds us that the siddha is all, pervading. Due to its stock of karma, which, we recall, is the result of dharma and adharma, and of course the klesas underpinning them, it remains confined within the contours of a specific body. To be technically precise, its vitas are defined in any particular life by the set of saskras activated for that specific life, that is, its karma, such that it is confined to those contours, and the klesas cement the misidentification with that form. The yogi who has transcended these klesas through discernment can perform sayama on this stock of karma, causing it to lose its grip on confining or limiting the siddha. The siddha can now transcend its confinement to that particular body and move outside of it, into other bodies if so desired, says Patanjali. Vekaspati Misra refers to Na with Makron S in the body as the passageways through which the mind travels to perform its functions. The relevant Na with Makron is identified by Bhojaraja as the Siddhavaha Na with Makron, the Siddha, carrying Na with Makron, whose function is evident in the name assigned to it. As discussed, the Na with Makron S carry the pro-life heirs, and thus it appears they carry the mind as well. Vekaspati Misra also mentions yogis who may have learned how to loosen the bondage of karma and thus are no longer bound to the body but who do not necessarily know the passageways that the mind must take to exit from the body to enter the body of others without harming the yogi. This is why the loosening of karma is mentioned by Patanjali here in combination with knowledge of the passageways of the mind in order to perform the feat mentioned. In this sutra, in his yoga, sastra, the Jain scholar Hemakhandra, 1088-1172, describes this process, after exiting through the aperture at the crown of the head, one should enter pravijya another body through the downward moving breath. Then one should spread oneself from the lotus at the navel, to the lotus at the heart via the suan or central subtle channel. At that point, one should obstruct the movement of the others per with one's own breath vayu. From that body, he should continue in this fashion until that embodied being falls flat, his movement faded away. When that other body has been completely liberated of its previous occupant, the yogin whose actions and senses have come alive in all the activities of the other should commence movement as if in his own body. The intelligent yogin may play about fully in that other body for half a day or even a day. Again, through that same process one should enter one's own body. 73 A well, known story featuring this power is found in the traditional hagiographies of our commentator Akara. 74 One day, Akara sought out Kumarila Bat, the foremost proponent of the rival Purva MMA with Makron SA with Makron school in his age, in order to debate with him. However, the great scholar was on his deathbed and directed Akara to his disciple, Visvarapa, more commonly known as, or identified with, the great intellectual, Mana Misra. Curiously, the referee at the debate was Mana's own wife, the learned Bharti, regarded as an incarnation of the goddess Sarasvati. Bharti had much to lose in the affair, since the agreement was that if Akara won, Mana would renounce his wife and possessions and become a sannyasi 75 disciple of Akara. On the other hand, if Mana won, Akara would renounce sannyasa and consent. To marriage and the life of a householder, a fallen and thus very socially undesirable outcome for a sannyasi. The debate is said to have lasted for weeks, until Mana eventually conceded defeat. Bharti was a fair judge, but before declaring Akara the winner, she challenged him with questions pertaining to the Kama, Sastra, the Sanskrit treatises concerned with eroticism, conjugal love, and desire about which the ascetic and renunciant Akara had had no experience. Akara accordingly requested a delay in proceedings during which time he entered the body of a dying king by the Sarara, 
Avasa technique indicated in the Sutra by Patanjali. During this time, he experienced various aspects of conjugal love with the king's queen such that he was able to return equipped with the appropriate answers to Bardi's questions, but not before he became so immersed in incessant love making with the king's queen that he forgot all about his mission and was saved. In the nick of time by the quick thinking of his disciples from having his original sannyasa body burnt by the king's suspicious ministers. The honorable Mana was to become Shurasvara, the most celebrated disciple of Ikara, writing sub-commentaries on some of Ikara's Upaniyad commentaries as well as independent treatises of his own. A parallel, but slightly different, story occurs in the Mahabharata, 15. 33.24 ff. Before leaving his mortal frame, the counselor, and well, wisher of the Pava brothers entered the body of King Yudhahira due to his yoga power. He united his life heirs and powers of the senses with the kings, such that the latter felt empowered and endowed with more virtues than before. In a similar narrative, 12. 31.29 ff, the sage Bharadvaha entered the body of Prince Pratarthana from the age of 13 and empowered him such that he could master at such a young age Vedic as well as military knowledge systems. Elsewhere in the epic, 13. 40 to 41, the sage Vipula entered into the body of his guru's wife, Rusai, unequaled in beauty, to protect her from the seductive malintentions of the infamous Indra, lord of the celestials, while his guru was absent. Unbeknownst to her, Vipula penetrated her body and joined his eyes with her eyes, and his eyelashes with her eyelashes, like the wind pervades space, 13. 40.56 Indra, endowed with sthis such that he could assume any form at will even that of the wind adopted a seductive form and entered into the hermitage of the sage who had departed to perform a sacrifice, intending to seduce Rosai. Even though the innocent Rosai was attracted to this beautiful intruder and made to offer him some words of welcome, her senses were restrained due to her being possessed by Vipula, who had decided that this was the only way of protecting her from the powerful celestial. Instead of articulating the words she had in mind, Rusai found herself uttering against her will a blunter accusation, prompted by Vipula within her. 3. 39 Yudna, Jayajjala, Paka, Kokdavasaga Utkranti Ca Yudna, one of the pras, vital heirs, J8, from mastery over, Jala, water, Paka, mud, Kaka, thorns, Dayu, etc. Asaga, non-contact with, Udkranti, ascension, levitation, ca, and by mastery over the Yudna vital air, one attains the power of levitation and does not come into contact with water, mud, and thorns, etc. The commentaries briefly discuss the five pras, or vital airs, that circulate around the body in connection with the sutra. Vakaspati Misra quotes a verse stating that the five pras are all manifestations of the air element, 76 but Vijanabhiku, following the Skakarakas and the Vedanta Sutras, 77 insists that there is a difference between pra and mundane air, which is one of the five gross elements. 78 the five pras are mentioned as early as the Shandojya Upaniyad, v. 19 to 24. The most important is itself called pra, and when it leaves the body, the other vital airs follow. In the Prasna Upaniyad it is stated, just as a king appoints administrators stating, you oversee these villages, and you these, Sopra directs the other life heirs to their respective places, 3. 4. Vyasa's understanding of these heirs is that pra corresponds to the air that moves through the mouth and nose and circulates as far as the heart, 79 Samana, pra is present in the navel and distributes, food, equally, around the body, apana, pra is present down to the solace of the feet, and carries away, the waste products of the body, vayana, pra is, so called because it is spread all over, the body, adi and yudana, pra manifests up to the head and is so called because it carries up, yudi, levitation, utkranti, is attained by the manipulation of the yudana, pra, 
more or less the entirety of the Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain Yoga traditions across the centuries have always claimed that the body can be made to levitate by manipulating internal air currents. Pra. Perhaps the earliest literary reference to such feats is expressed in the oldest Indo-European text, the RG Veda, where the long-haired ascetic, Kezan, flies through the atmosphere, and Tarkavatatai, X. 136, and stories of this the abound in the hagiographical literatures of Hindu yogis throughout the centuries, and indeed, still surface on the yogic landscape of the West, most conspicuously in the Transcendental Meditation Organization AD1. Not only is levitation attained by mastery over the Yudhana, pra, says Vyasa, but by the manipulation of this pra, the yogi takes the auspicious upward path out of the body at death. This is a reference to the two pathways that can be taken by the departed soul after death, an upward one toward liberation and a downward one toward rebirth. These are mentioned in the Bhadrayaka Upanishad, 6. 15. The Shandogya Upanishad, v. 10. The Jita, 8. 26. And discussed in the Vedanta Sutras, 3. 1. And the yogi can leave the body at will, adds Ramnanda Sarasvati. 3. 40 Samana, J8 J Valanam Samana, over the Samana vital air, J8, by mastery, J Valanam, effulgence by mastery over the Samana vital air, radiance is attained. By stimulating the fire in the body, one becomes radiant and effulgent, J Valana, say the commentators. Commentators. Harry Harananda notes that the Samana, Pra is responsible for nourishing all parts of the body, and so, by mastering this Pra, the yogi gets an aura around the body. As with the halo in Christian iconography, auras are commonly associated with saints and yogis in the Indic traditions, explainable in yogic vocabulary by the prominence of the radiant and effulgent characteristics of sattva pervading the yogi as siddha, and emanating out due to transcending the limitations of the klesas. Vijanabhiku additionally understands the Jayvalanam of the Sutra as referring to the ability to self-combust. He mentions the story of Sathi, the wife of Lord Shiva, as an example of someone manipulating the Yudhana, pra in order to cast off her body by self-combustion. Offended by her own father, the proud ritualist Dhaka, who had disregarded and insulted her husband, Shiva, Sathi determined to sever all relations with him to the point of casting off the body that had been begotten. Begotten by him. Sathi, who had mastered Asana, first neutralized the up, flowing and down, flowing pra and apana ears, as touched on in 2. 49 to 50, then raised the Yudhana, pra up from the navel kakra, held it in the heart area with concentration, and then drew it up through her throat and to between her eyebrows, from which point her body self, ignited by the power of her samadhi concentration, Bhagavata Pura 4. 4.25 King Thera, the uncle of the five Pavas and father of their hundred cousins from the Mahabharata, also self, ignited his body as a result of his yogic practice, according to the Bhagavata Pura rendition of his final days, which differs from the account in the epic. After the great Mahabharata war, in which all his sons and kinsmen had been killed, the old king received persuasive instructions from his half-brother and counselor Vijara not to die in a wretched fashion while clinging to his attachments and false sense of security in the royal household. Especially since, in addition to being blind from birth, he was now becoming deaf, dull, feeble, and infirm from old age. Enlightened by the words of his well-wisher, Thera headed for the Himalayas, the destination of those desirous of liberation. We include here the verses spoken by the sage Narada describing his subsequent practice, since it gives another Bhagavata, flavored version of classical yoga featuring meditation on Isvara and culminating in self, combustion, the topic of the sutra, with a peaceful mind and free from desire, he Thera subsists on water. He has mastered Asana along with Prima, and has withdrawn the six senses, Pratyahara. His impurities of sattva, rajas, and tamas have been destroyed, through meditation on Harivayu Slashka. 
he will cast off his body on the fifth day from today, O king, and it will be reduced to ashes. I. 13.53 FF. 3. 41 Radrakeo Sambandha, Sayam Devyasritram Sritra, Ear, Organ of Hearing, Kao, Ether, Sambandha, Relationship, Sayamd, by Sayama, Devyam, Divine, Sritram, Hearing by Sayama on the relationship between the organ of hearing and the ether, divine hearing is attained. Ether, Akaza, in thought, is the substratum of sound. Sound vibrations require a medium in which to vibrate, and, by a process of elimination, the commentators argue that this substratum must be ether. In fact, ether is itself generated from the tanmatra, or subtle element, of sound so sound is both inherent in ether and conveyed through it. Ether is therefore considered to be present in the ear, such that it can pick up the vibrations of sound. Patanjali here states that by Sayama on the relationship between ether and the ear, the yogi is able to surpass the limitations of the physical ear and access divine sounds, Divyam Sridram. In conventional hearing, says Pojaraja, Hearing catches only the sounds that vibrate within the pocket of ether enclosed by the ear, however, since ether is all, pervading, and so potentially is the sattvic siddha, the accomplished yogi s siddha is believed to be able to transcend identification with the body and expand out to access sound beyond the realm of normal hearing vibrating anywhere in the ether, siddha, being subtler than ether, can pervade it. Parallel abilities can be attained by Sayama on the other four senses and the respective subtle elements with which they are associated, air and the skin, light and the eye, water and the tongue, earth and the nose. In other words, the yogi develops supernormal sensual. Sensual abilities, another long, standing claim of the yoga tradition. 3. 42 Kaikeo Sambandha, Sayamel Lagu, Tula, Samapats Kekaza, Gamanam Kaya, the body, Akazeo, Ether, Sambandha, the relationship, Sayamd, by Sayama, Lagu, Light, Tula, Cotton, Sampad, a type of intense concentration, CA, and Akaza, Sky, Gamanam, movement, passage by performing Sayama on the relationship between the body and ether and by performing samapati on the lightness of cotton, one acquires the ability to travel through the sky. Recall that samapati involves concentrating intensely on an object such that the meditator becomes as if one with the object of meditation. Exactly how this differs from sayama in the sutra is not discussed by our commentators, although see discussion in I. 41, but the two processes appear very similar if not the same. In the commentaries of the Vedanta tradition, 4. 2.16, Samapati denotes merging, which in the context of yoga points to the Siddha's merger with the Siddha's substructure of any object of meditation as a result of its intense focus. The body moves in ether, or space, and by performing Sayama on this relationship, as well as by total absorption on light entities such as cotton or atoms, one can become so light that one can walk on water, spider webs, or rays of light, according to the commentaries. Ramnanda Sarasvati takes these abilities as a progression reflecting the density of the medium of travel, first the yogi is able to walk on water, then spider webs, then light rays, then course through the air at will. The metaphysical principle operating here seems to be the same one that pervades many of the sthis, by manipulating the substratum, one can transform the nature of its effects. The gross elements are all transformations of ether, which means they are in essence ether. By Sayama on this relationship, it seems that the yogi can potentially increase the sattva component of the body, thereby minimizing the tamas component, and thus manifest the inherent ethereal nature or quality constituting the body such that it takes on the qualities of ether. Ether takes on the form of the body, says Vijanabhiku the body is pervaded by ether, after all, it is essentially ether, from the perspective of the evolution of the material elements. This effect can also be attained by Sayama on light things such as cotton, tula, as well, following a similar principle. 
This results in unimpeded freedom of movement, since ether is all, pervading. The yogi can thus move freely through the air, and some of the earliest records of Vedic literature preserve references to ascetics who had various powers, such as the ability to fly through the air and appear at will, a pastamba, sutra 2. 9.23.6, 8, Sama, Vidhana 3. 9.1. Perhaps the best, known sage in the Puric genre is Narada Muni, who is always traveling around the universe carrying his VA with Makron, stringed instrument, visiting his disciples to impart instructions to them and constantly singing the glories of Lord Vayu. 3. 43 Bayar, Akalpitavitir Maha, Videhatata Prakvara, Kiyabahi, outside, Akalpita, not imagined, Viti, state of mind, Maha, great, Videha, out of the body, Tata, by that, Prakasa, light, Vara, covering, Kia, destruction the state of mind projected outside of the body, which is not an imagined state, is called the great out, of, body experience. By this, the covering of the light of Budhai is destroyed. From what can be understood from the commentaries, it seems that this verse is taken to indicate that one can project the mind out of the body in two ways, imagined and non-imagined. The mind, although situated within the body, can focus on something outside the body, which is called Kulpita or an imagined out, of, body experience. Everyone engages in this all the time, when you focus your mind on the book you are reading, the mind, in a sense, is being projected out of the body. But advanced yogis are believed to be able to actually physically project the mind completely outside of the body at will such that it can function independently from the body. This is called an akalpita or non-imagined out, of, body experience. We are all familiar with imaging or thinking about things outside of ourselves, and projecting our minds here and there, but Patanjali here states that the yogi is able actually to disconnect the mind completely from the body and roam around at will independent of the body and, if he or she so desires, enter the bodies of others by this method. 3. 38. As Pojaraja notes, it is because the false ego is removed that the yogi develops the ability to exit the body at will, in other words, the klesas have been transcended. False ego, ahakra, means misidentifying with the body, as a consequence of which one is confined to the body until its destruction. So when false ego is destroyed, the bonds that bind the soul to the body are released, and the yogi is no longer subject to confinement in the body even while the body is still alive. Along these lines, Patanjali notes that by this practice, the yogi diminishes the coverings, vera, that envelop the pure light, prakasa, which is to say the sattva potential of buddha. These coverings are the klesas and karma with its fruits, which are caused by the gwas, says Vyasa. According to Hari Harananda, this takes place because by such out, of, body experiences it becomes clear that the self is not the body, and so the base of ignorance, namely, any residual thinking that I am this body, is further eliminated. And as we know, ignorance is the substratum of the other klesas and consequently of the karma produced by them. 3. 44 Schula, Svarapa, Skmvirthavitva, Sayamt Buddha, Jayas Chula, Gross, Svarapa, Essential Nature or Character, Skma, Subtle, and Vaya, Constitution, Arthavitva, Purpose, Significance, Sayamt, from the performance of Sayama, Buddha, Elements. Jaya, mastery by Sayama on the gross nature, essential nature, subtle nature, constitution, and purpose of objects, one attains mastery over the elements. As has been stressed throughout this chapter, to understand the mechanics of the sthi powers from the perspective of yoga presuppositions, one needs to understand the metaphysics of skya and yoga. The feats outlined in this chapter have sometimes been called magic, 82 which can carry connotations of harnessing the power of sinister spirits and other notions inappropriate in the context of the Yoga Sutras. The term also has connotations of supernaturalism, 
of mysteriously transcending the known laws of nature, which is more appropriate to the present context, although, considered from within the parameters of Ski philosophy, the principles underpinning the Sthis are not actually mysterious but are internally consistent with the metaphysics of the system. This sutra provides further insight into their workings. As we have seen, the yogi performs sayama on some material object, whatever it might be, sun, moon, sense organ, etc. And consequently is able to manipulate, rearrange and tamper with the natural order of things. How does this transpire? In this sutra, Patanjali considers what exactly constitutes physical objects such that they are amenable to such transformations by considering their metaphysical makeup on five progressively more subtle levels of prakti. The first two levels, the gross, schula, and essential, svarapa, natures of an object require a further discussion of two categories in Indic thought initiated in I. 49, Vaya and Samanya. Vaya, in the thought of the school of Vaidyaka, means particularity, that which makes an entity particular and distinct from other entities. The school of Vaidyaka takes its name from Vaya, which ultimately refers to a metaphysical category or ingredient of reality that distinguishes or individualizes one fundamental entity or subatomic particle from another. Vyasa uses the term more in the sense of Vaya, Hwa, or distinguishing quality of an entity. For example, in the present context, each of the five elements has a via, qua, the distinguishing property or particular quality of the water element, for example, is taste. Other substances have taste only to the extent to which they contain some portion of water. Each element's via, qua will be discussed below. Samania, on the contrary, according to the Vaidyaka school, means an essential feature that produces commonality among entities rather than distinguishing between them, as is the case with Vaya. 83 here, too, Vyasa uses the term in a narrower sense to refer to the Dharma, also a type of property in Hindu philosophical discourse but that Vyasa correlates with properties different from those indicated by Gwa. This will be clarified below. In any event, Terms such as Vaya and Samanya and their analyses are especially associated with the Vaidyaka school, where they are construed somewhat differently from their utilization here. According to the Yoga tradition, by the first aspect mentioned in the Sutra, the Schula, gross nature, or aspect of an object, Patanjali is referring to the object's elemental makeup of ether, air, fire, water, and earth the Mahabhutas. As noted, these elements have Vaya, was specific qualities, associated with each of them. So the specific quality of ether is sound, the specific quality of air is touch, since air evolves from ether, it also has sound, the quality present in ether, the specific quality of fire is sight, since fire evolves from air, which in turn evolves from ether, it also has the qualities of both, sound and touch, the specific quality of water is taste, since water, in turn, evolves from fire, it also has the qualities of the previous elements, sound, touch, sight, and the specific quality of earth is smell, since earth is the last of the EVOLUTES, it also has the qualities of all four previous EVOLUTES. Thus, as a result of the presence of the wind element, we can feel something, as a result of the presence of the water element, we can taste something, as a result of the earth substance, we can smell something, and so on, therefore pure water has no smell, only muddy water, which contains earth, does. We notice that each element includes the qualities of the previous elements in addition to its own special quality. Thus earth, which evolves from water which itself evolves from fire which itself evolves from air which evolves from ether, has all the qualities, and each other member of this list progressively has one less. So ether pervades all the elements, air pervades fire, water, and earth, fire pervades water and earth, and so on. Also, it is important to note that at this gross level, sound, touch, sight, taste, and smell are not. The generic and non-differentiated subtle energies corresponding to these sensibilities, the ten matras, 
which will be encountered at the third level, below, but are sound, touch, etc. As manifest in gross form. This means demarcated by differentiation into the full range of different sounds, smells, tastes, etc. that exist in the perceivable world. For example, sound at this level is manifest in a range of sound in musical notes such as do, ma, etc. Of the Hindu music scale, touch is subdivided into the range of sensations such as hot or cold, sight is determined by the range of colors such as blue or yellow, taste becomes distinctive in the range of flavors such as stringent or astringent, and smell manifests in a variety of odors such as sweet, smelling or otherwise. All this the elements and their special characteristics constitutes the gross aspect of an object. The Nyaya and Vaiyaka schools in particular have taken it upon themselves to produce lists of all these various qualities, characteristics, and sub-characteristics. Sub-characteristics of gross objects, although there are some significant differences between these schools and those of the Yoga and Ski lineages on certain issues. 84 The second item listed by Patanjali, Svarupa, essential nature, is understood as relating to an object's samanya, its universal or general properties, more abstract or subtle aspects or properties of an object, which Vyasa discusses in terms of the dharma or inherent nature of an object. 85 Universal properties are listed in some detail in the commentaries. For example, in terms of the elements themselves, among the properties of ether noted by Vyasa and the commentaries is its all, pervadingness and interpenetration, it pervades all objects, of air, its constant motion and the ability to move, of fire, its heat and light, of water, its liquidity and cohesion, and of earth, its shape and weight. 86 These properties are universal insofar as they underpin all objects in their categories. So, for example, everything with the earth element has form, that is, has the universal property of being limited in its extension, everything with water has cohesion in accordance with the proportion of water contained in it. In sum, Vyasa notes that form, liquidity, heat, movement, and all, pervadingness are the general properties, samanya, of earth, water, fire, air, and ether, respectively, and the qualities of smell, taste, visibility, touch, and sound are their corresponding specific or particular qualities, via, was. A substance, dravya, is a combination of these generic and specific qualities, and more specifically, one in which these qualities or properties are inherent, rather than distinct, entities 87, contra nyaya and vayaka So when one encounters a physical object, the most immediate aspect of it that one experiences is its gross nature or elemental makeup, and its specific qualities, which are pervaded by the object's essential nature, all of which comprise the first two items listed in the sutra. 89. Moving on to the third feature, the skma, subtle aspect of an object, consists of the ten matras, subtle elements, from which the gross aspects such as earth, etc evolve, and it is here that the Skya school parts company with the Nyaya and Vaiyaka schools. The ten matras are sound, touch, sight, taste, and smell, but these are not specific sounds and touch, etc. Sensations, the do or ma of the Hindu music scale, hot or cold, etc. Mentioned above, but generic undifferentiated sound and touch, etc within which the variations of specific sounds and touch sensations are latent, they have not yet burst forth to manifest their full range of differentiated sounds, tastes, etc. As is the case with level 1. Although translated simplistically as sound, touch, taste, etc. The ten matras are a set of vibrational energies that underpin these sense capabilities. The element of ether is produced, according to schemetaphysics, from generic sound, air from generic touch and sound, fire from generic sight, touch, and sound, water from generic taste, sight, touch, and sound, and earth from generic smell, taste, sight, touch, and sound. Another way of putting this is that the atoms, 
which correspond to the elements of ether, air, fire, water, and earth, are themselves composed of the ten matras. If one dissects or dissolves any object, penetrates more subtly into its metaphysical makeup, one will realize that the ultimate subatomic particles constituting the physical elements with their qualities are actually individualized densifications, or gross externalizations of a still more subtle energy or set of energies the ten matras. The fourth item, constitution, and vya, is taken by the commentators to refer to the three quas. Penetrating even more deeply into an object's constituents, one comes to its fundamental makeup and realizes that everything in manifest reality, including the ten matras, is ultimately composed of sattva, rajas, and tamas. Finally, on a less metaphysical and more abstract level, one arrives at the fifth item mentioned in the sutra, arthavitva, purpose, which pertains more to functionality than metaphysics. The purpose of all objects in manifest reality is twofold, to provide to the Puru either enjoyment, and its consequence, bondage, or liberation, as noted in 2. 18. By Sayama on these progressively more subtle ways of perceiving objects in the external world, the yogi attains mastery over them. By manipulating the subtle substructure of anything in physical reality with one's will a function of Siddha one can rearrange the gross externalization of that object. As Vyasa puts it, when Sayama is perfected, the elements follow the will of the yogi, as calves follow the cow. Since everything is ultimately a product of the three primary guas, by manipulating the proportion of the guas in an object one can completely transform its makeup, just as one can completely change the color of something by adjusting the proportions of the primary colors red, yellow, and blue. Or, in Das Gupta's terms, the difference between one thing and another is simply this, that its collocation of atoms, or the arrangement or grouping of atoms is different from another. The formation of a collocation has an inherent barrier against any change. Providing the suitable barriers can be removed, anything could be changed to any other thing, 255-56. Since Budhai, and Ahakra, ultimately underpin the ten matras which, in turn, underpin the subatomic particles that comprise matter, the yoga traditions holds that Budhai can be manipulated to rearrange the groupings of such atoms, which are nothing but a densification of itself to create new effects. This is not magic from the perspective of yoga. It is subtle physics. Vijanabhika correlates the Vitarka, Samadhi with meditation on the gross nature of an object, which implies other stages of Samadhi mentioned in the first chapter, specifically, Vikara could be correlated with the other, more subtle, and rarefied natures of an object, as outlined in the sutra and discussed more specifically in I. 42. 3. 45. Tato Imdi, Pairdurbite Bakaya, Samput, Tad, Dermanabhyatasya Tata, from that, Aim, the mystic power of Aim Lightness, ADI, etc. Pairdurbite the appearance of, Kaya, body, Samput, accomplishment, perfection, Tad, they're the elements, dharma, essential nature, anapita, non-resistance, absence of limitations, ca, and as a result of this, there are no limitations on account of the body's natural abilities. Mystic powers such as aim, etc. manifest, and the body attains perfection. Here Patanjali lists three consequences of the type of sayama discussed in the previous sutra. For the removal of limitations on account of the body's natural abilities, dharma, anapayata, vyasa lists the following, 1. The earth does not obstruct the yogi by its quality of solidness, such that the yogi can enter even a stone. 2. Water, though moist, does not wet the yogi. 3. Fire, though hot, does not burn the yogi. 4. Wind, though moving, does not budge the yogi. 5. Ether, which normally does not cover anything, covers the yogi such that he or she remains invisible even to the siddhas. Siddhas, or those who have attained these very powers. 
The eight mystic powers mentioned in the sutra refer to the standardized list of powers that are ubiquitous in classical Hindu texts. That Patanjali sees fit to note only the first one, Amadai, followed by etc. Indicates that these were already well, known to his audience. The first four powers pertain to Sayama on various gross aspects of Prakti, the remainder on various subtle aspects. These eight powers are, 1, Ama, minuteness, the ability to make one's body atomic in size. This allows one to become small enough to enter into anything, even the dense substructure of a diamond, says Akira, and by so doing to become invisible to anyone. 2. Lagima, lightness, the ability to make the body as light as one desires in terms of weight, as light as cotton, say the commentators. 3. Mahima, largeness, the ability to make the body as heavy in weight as one desires. 4. Prapti, attainment, the ability to attain anything one desires one can touch the moon with one's fingertips, says Vyasa. 5. Prakamaya, freedom of will, the ability to be unobstructed in one's desires one can dive into the earth just as one plunges into water, says Vyasa. 6. Vasitva, mastery, the ability to control the elements and their qualities, and to control other beings. 7. Itva, lordship, the ability to control the outward appearance, disappearance, disappearance, and rearrangement of the elements. 8. Yatra, Kamevasayatva, the ability to manipulate the elements at will according to one's fancy. In short, once one attains perfection in the sthis that accrue from meditation, one becomes practically omniscient and omnipotent. The Hindu and Buddhist traditions are replete with stories pertaining to the magical powers of the accomplished yogi. However, the commentators hasten to add, this does not mean that a yogi whimsically disrupts the natural order of things. The yogi respects the will of his vara, the Lord, who is eternally perfect and by whose will the natural order of things was arranged in the first place. Free from personal ego and desire, what reason could the yogi have to interfere with his vara's plan? To do so, says Akira, would, quite apart from desire and ego, indicate animosity toward his vara, and the yogi, at this point, has been purified of such base qualities. One might mention here, along with Vijanab Hiku, that, according to the Vedanta Sutras, for 4.17, the yogi s quasi, omnipotent powers do not extend to the ability to create a universe. They are limited in this one regard, and this limitation distinguishes the ordinary Purua from Isvara, according to the Vedanta school. The perfection of the body, the third accomplishment mentioned in the sutra, is the topic of the next sutra. 3. 46 Rupa, Lvaya, Bala, Vitra, Sahananatnikaya, Sampat Rupa, Beauty of Form, Lvaya, Charm, Grace, Bala, Strength, Vitra, Thunderbolt, Sahananatni, Being of a Solid Nature, Kaya. The body, Sampat, perfection the perfection of the body consists of possessing beauty charm strength and the power of a thunderbolt the commentators consider the sutra which expounds on the perfection of the body the last item listed in the previous sutra as self explanatory and offer no further comments the vitra mentioned here usually associated in hinduism with indra king of the demigods is a thunderbolt weapon Indra is the Indic equivalent to culturally cognate Indo-European figures such as Thor and Zeus, and his Vajra is fashioned, according to the Bhagavata Pura, 6. 10.13, from the bones of the sage Dadhisai and said to be almost unbreakably hard. Ramnanda Sarasvati gives Hanuman, the devoted monkey servant of Lord Rama, as an example of someone who has attained the sthi mentioned in the sutra, and, indeed, one of Hanuman's names is Vajraka one who has the limbs of a thunderbolt. 3. 47 Graha, Svarapasma Tanve Arthavitva, Sayamd Indriya, Jayagraha, the process of obtaining knowledge, Svarapa, the essence, Asmita, the ego, Anvaya, inherent quality, 
constitution, arthavitva, purposefulness, sayamt, visayama, concentration, on, indriya, the senses, jaya, victory, control by the performance of sayama on the process of knowing, on the essence the sense organs, on ego, on the constitution of the gwas, and on the purpose of the gwas comes control over the senses. This sutra analyzes another set of five progressively progressively more rarefied ways of perceiving reality, in this case the metaphysical makeup of the senses with a view to attaining supreme control over them and thus overlaps with 3. 44, which in parallel fashion analyzes the objects of the senses in five progressively more rarefied ways. Graha, the process of knowledge, refers to the operation of the senses on the sense objects, the objects of sound, touch, sight, taste, and smell. As we know from I. 41, graha literally means grasping and refers here to the process by which the sense objects are grasped or experienced by means of the channels of the senses. It is the act of acquiring knowledge. Vyasa and the commentators take the second item on this list, Svarupa, the essence, to refer to the sattvic modification of buddhai, the intellect, which underpins the illumination, or knowledge, acquiring abilities of the senses. In other words, the ten mattress sound, sight, touch, taste, smell, etc. which are the powers behind the functions of the senses, are sattvic in essence. As indicated in 3. 44, these are the general functions of sound, taste, etc. rather than their particulars in specific notes or tastes, which manifest at the level of sense objects. 90 next, Asmita, is specifically correlated with the Ahakra by Vyasa, so these are more or less synonymous terms used in the Yoga and Skya schools, respectively, for the ego. Etymologically Asmita means I, am, Ness, whereas Ahakra means I am the doer, so there is a slight distinction in emphasis, as discussed previously. Regardless, these terms refer to the misidentification of the non-self with the self. It is from Ahakra that the senses emerge, as indicated on the skit chart in the introduction. So Asmita is a still finer cause of sense activity. As in 3. 44, Anvaya, the fourth item, is taken by the commentators to refer to the three Gwas, which underpin even ego and, therefore, ultimately also the senses, which are derivatives of ego, see Skichart in the introduction. Since Vyasa speaks of determination here, and since determination is a feature of Buddhai, intelligence, Vijanabhiku understands this fourth dimension of the makeup of the senses to refer more specifically to Buddhai than the Gwas. This also works from a metaphysical perspective, as Ahakra, Asmita, and thus its evolut such as the senses are themselves derivates from Buddhai, which is the first evolute from Prakti. Finally, again as in 3. 44, at the ultimate rarefied level, underpinning the activities of the Gwas, is their Arthavitva, ultimate purpose vis, a, vispurua. This purpose is to provide experience or liberation to Purua. Thus, paralleling his analysis of the sense objects in 3. 44, Vyasa has deconstructed the actual senses themselves into their progressively more subtle constituents, their grossest aspect as their function of acquiring knowledge of the sense objects, their sattvic constitution, their essential nature as evolutes of Ahakra, their even more subtle nature as expressions of Buddhai, which is itself a product of the Gwas, and finally their subtlest nature, which is their epistemological purpose for existing in the first place. By performing sayama on the senses in these progressively more rarefied ways, the yogi masters them sequentially, says Vyasa. Once this is accomplished, the senses can be said to be fully mastered, Indriya, Jaya. 3. 48 Tato Mano, Javitvam Vakara, Vaitva Pradhana, Jaya Ca Tata, from that, Mana, of the mind, Javitvam, quickness, Vakara, without instruments, Vaitva, existence, Pradhana, primordial matter, Jaya, victory, 
ca and as a result of this comes speed like the speed of mind activity independent of the bodily senses and mastery over primordial matter Patanjali here refers to three more sets of powers that accrue to the yogi who has conquered the senses in the manner outlined in the previous sutra. Once one has mastered the senses, one's body can move at the speed of mind, mano, javitvam, one can act and attain knowledge at any time or place even without one's body and its sense organs of perception, vikara, bhava, and one attains mastery over the primordial pyrktic matrix 91 and therefore, specify the commentators, over all its evolutes and thus all manifest reality, Pradhana, Jaya. Here we again see another articulation of the yogic claim to omnipotence and omniscience. Vyasa groups together the attainment of these three types of abilities under the term Madhu, Pratika. In his yoga, Vartika commentary, Vijanabhika connects the latter two powers referred to in the Sutra by Patanjali with the attainments of the two types of yogis referred to in I. 19, the Videha, Bodhiless Ones, and the Prakti, Laya, those merged in Prakti. In his Yoga, Sara commentary, Vijanabhiku states that it is on account of the first power, Mano, Javitvam, moving at the speed of mind, that great Siddhas are able to appear in a moment before their disciples merely on the latter's thinking of them. 92 Thus when the traditional Vyasa divider of the Vedas, compiler of the Puras, and author of the Mahabharata, whom the yoga tradition correlates with our commentator Vyasa, became despondent, his heart unfulfilled despite his immense labors, since he had yet to write the Bhagavata Pura and thus to fully expound the truths of the Supreme Lord Vayu, his guru, Narada, appeared before him to counsel him, I. 4.26 FF this belief in the Guru manifesting before the disciple at a moment of crisis is still evidenced in, for example, Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi. 3. 49 Sattva, Purunyat, Kyadi, Matrajya Sarva, Vaiditvam Sarva, Jaitvam Ca Sattva, Intellect, Purua, The Self, Soul, Anyata, Difference, Kyadi, Discernment, Matrajya, of one, only, sarva, all, bhava, state of existence, adhitvam, state of supremacy over, sarva, all, jaitvam, state of knowledge, ca, and only for one who discerns the difference between the purua and the intellect do omniscience and omnipotence accrue. When buddhai has been cleansed of its rajasic and tamasic ingredients such that only pure sattva remains, it attains a state of perfect clarity that Vyasa calls Vasakara. In this state, the yogi has full realization of the difference between the highest aspect of the cognitive faculty, pure buddha, 93 and the purua itself, sattva, purua, anyata. Needless to say, we are still within the realms of sabhaja, samadhi at this point. The consciousness of Purua is directed outward insofar as it is still conscious of Budhai, albeit Budhai in its ultimate purified state, rather than directed inward toward pure self, awareness. But the yogi now has complete control, Vasakara, over manifest reality, the Gwas, which are the essence of everything in manifest reality, submit themselves before their owner, the Ketraja, or master of the field, of Prakti, says Vyasa using terms that are likely drawn from the 13th chapter of the Gita. 94 They are manipulated by the will of the yogi, like iron filings are manipulated by the presence of a magnet, says Vijanabhiku. Omniscience, Sarva, Jaitva, continues Vyasa, simply means discriminate awareness of the three Gwas. If one perceives the true nature of the Gwas, one automatically understands any past, present, or future product emanating from them, just as one can understand the true and ultimate nature of any color, past, present, or future, once one understands how the essential components of the three colors red, yellow, and blue combine to produce the variegated universe of color. Vijanabhiku notes that, in principle at least, all Puruas are masters over the Gwas, but, due to the Klesas and their ensuing obstacles such as vice, etc., in other words, 
due to the prevalence of Rajas and Tamas the Gwas do not submit themselves to all Puruas at all times. But the Yogi who has reached the stage indicated in the Sutra has full mastery over them, Sarva, Bhava, and Hitva. The Jains have an interesting counterpart to this. In the Jain traditions, karma is conceived of in a much more physical fashion than in the Hindu slash Buddhist schools. It literally sticks onto the Atman, depending on the degree of the soul's passions and cravings, which act as a sort of glue. Like dirt covering a lamp. 95 When this karma is partly destroyed it frees up the yogi's awareness such that it can perceive forms that are normally beyond the purview of the senses, like the light of a lamp can pervade farther when some of the dirt covering it is removed. In other words, the yogi develops supernormal powers of the senses, of the jnana. When the soul has overcome hatred and jealousy, etc. The light of the admin can penetrate farther and access subtler dimensions, its awareness can have direct perception of the thoughts of others, past and present, mana, parayaya. Finally, when all karma is totally removed, with awareness now unimpeded, like a simple light that can pervade the entire universe if there are no obstructions to impede it, absolute omniscience and omnipotence arise in the soul, Kevala, Jainana. Vyasa uses the term Vizoka, sorrowlessness, here to describe the state of omniscience. What is sorrow, after all, but the reaction to the loss of something pertaining to prakti, or the feeling of deprivation when one cannot attain some such thing? Needless to say, the point is theoretical, since to have arrived at this stage the yogi has perforce transcended attachment to objects and desire for them. But, if only in principle, if the yogi at this point has full control over prakti and her effects, and thus is obliged neither to lose any object of desire nor submit to powerlessness in attempts to obtain any such object, where is the question of sorrow? Obviously, grandiose claims of omniscience and omnipotence are hardly likely to appeal to the rational spirit of post-enlightenment thought. However, recalling our commitment to a phenomenological approach, such claims follow logically from within the parameters of skit or yoga metaphysics. This metaphysics holds that all material and psychic phenomena are evolutes of buddha. Only the klesas keep one's buddha localized and separate from the universal buddha. The first evolute from prakti, so once these are transcended, these individualizing limitations are surpassed. Consequently, if one can access and exert mastery over the universality of Buddha, one has full knowledge of and control over all its evolutes, namely, the entirety of material and psychic phenomena the phenomenal world. The claim to omniscience is thus internally consistent with the metaphysics of the skin system. Similar claims are fairly standard across Indic traditions, Tantric, Jain, Buddhist, etc. Including the Vedanta tradition. 96 in the Jain Kalpa, Sutra, 120.1, Mahavira, the contemporary of the Buddha who is the primary figurehead in the Jain tradition, attains liberation, called Kavalya, the same term used in 4.34 below, at which point he becomes omniscient, comprehending all objects, he knew and saw all conditions of the world, of gods, men, and demons, whence they come, whither they go, whether they are born as men or animals or become gods or hell, beings, the ideas, the thoughts of their minds, the food, doings, desires, the open and secret deeds of all living beings in the whole world. 97 Indeed, the Jains maintain that all souls must necessarily attain omniscience upon liberation. The Buddha, too, makes similar claims about himself, whatever, in this world with its devas and maras and brahma celestial beings is by the fold thereof, gods or men, recluses or brahmans, seen, heard, felt, discerned, accomplished, striven for, or devised in mind all is understood by the Tathagata Buddha. 98 Having said this, we might also revisit the fact that Putanjali in I. 25 made a point of noting and perhaps his comment there can now be considered in a different light that Tatranarataya Sarvajana, Bijam, as far as omniscience is unsurpassed. 
even if the yogi's awareness can pervade all of prakti, understand its past and future permutations, and access all things knowable as indicated in the sutra, nonetheless as far as omniscience is of a higher order. 1. Might wonder what else there is to know, if the yogi already knows everything past and present, but clearly and perhaps expectedly, whatever else there might be must be beyond the range of Siddha and Buddhai, since the yogi already knows all there is to be known within the ranges of these. In other words, if the yogi knows everything Pirktik, as indicated in these sutras, yet Isvara knows something that surpasses this, Adisayam, then might one have some grounds to infer that Isvara's additional omniscience, so to speak, might be associated with some level of experience beyond Prakti. Certainly the theologies of post, Akara Vedantins such as Ramanuj, Madhva, Kaitanya, and Volabha take this view and hold that there are numerous Brahman realms and dimensions beyond Prakti made not of Pirktik matter but of pure conscious Brahman, and these are inhabited by the unlimited supreme divine forms of Vayu slash Nraya slash Ka in the company of Quasi, Omniscient. Omniscient and omnipotent liberated Purus, also in forms of pure conscious Brahman, whose powers are nonetheless inferior to as far as 9-9 as elsewhere, one cannot project theologies from different times and contexts onto Patanjali Sutras, which unlike the earlier Skis-slash-Yoga traditions as well as the later commentators including Vyasa don't even mention Brahman. But if one chooses to step beyond Patanjali's characteristically tantalizing references of Isvara's super-omniscience, so to speak, one can find interesting examples of how this notion of graded omniscience and omnipotence gets developed in other later Vedantic traditions. In any event, where Patanjali differentiates between the omniscience of liberated Purus and that of Isvara, the Vedanta Sutras make a parallel statement pertaining to the difference between the omnipotence of liberated Purus and that of Isvara. 4. 4.17. The former has all the divine powers except the creatorship of the universe. Jagad Vyapara, Varjatam. Thus, in the Vedanta tradition, Isvara's omnipotence is unsurpassed, as his omniscience is for Patanjali. 3. 50 Tad. Varajiyad api doa, bija, k kaivalyam tad, that i dot e. Omniscience and omnipotence, varajiyad, from detachment, disinterest, api, even, doa, falls, bija, seeds, k, on the destruction of, kaivalyam, supreme independence, ultimate liberation by detachment even from this attainment i dot e. Omniscience and omnipotence, and upon the destruction of the seeds of all faults, Kavalya, the supreme liberation ensues. This sutra announces the ultimate goal of yoga or, more specifically, of the practice of Sayama. All other practices of Sayamas are but semblances of this ultimate Sayama, says Vekaspati Misra. This, as we know, is Nirbhaja, Samadhi, which Patanjali here refers to as Kavalya. Kavalya carries a range of meanings, including independence, aloneness, not being mixed with anything else. In other words, Puru has finally reached the state of complete detachment or uncoupling from Prakti. In this state, there is no interest in even the possibility of omnipotence and omniscience, which are obviously states of awareness related to Prakti, albeit Prakti in totality. When the klesas and subsequent seeds of karma have dwindled, says Vyasa, the yogi understands that even the most rarefied stage of discrimination noted in the previous sutra is still a product of sattva, and sattva, as it were, is still a product of prakti and so also ultimately comes under the category of things to be avoided, as outlined in 2. 15-16. Purua, in contrast, is unchanging and pure and distinct from even sattva. Thus, the yogi begins to cultivate detachment from pure sattva. Since the insight into the need to do this is itself a product of sattva, in a sense sattva is channeling its own discrimination toward deconstructing itself toward terminating its own functions. Consequently, the seeds of the klesas become burnt and incapable of sprouting, doa, bija, kia, 100 and, along with the mind that has harbored them, eventually dissolve back into the primordial Pirktic matrix. 
Once this happens, Purua does not again experience the threefold miseries, 101 which we know are caused by these Klesas. The Gwas have now fulfilled their purpose, says Vyasa, and no longer incite action. Now that they are quiescent, they do not distract the consciousness of Purua. Now that Purua is no longer externally conscious of another, it can be only internally conscious of itself. 102 This is Kavalya, absolute independence, in the sense that Purua is independent of the Gwas and their products, and thus of everything in manifest reality. This means it can now be conscious only of itself there is nothing else for it to be aware of once it ceases to be aware of Prakti. Purua is eternally aware, as the Jita stresses throughout the second chapter, the nature of Atman can never be destroyed or negated in any way. Purua can only and must be aware by its very constitution, so when it ceases to be aware of Prakti it has no other choice by dint of its very nature than to be aware of itself. Awareness can be self, aware or other, aware, 103 there are no other options. Situated exclusively in its own ultimate and autonomous nature, the Purua is now pure and unadulterated consciousness city, Sakti that is, consciousness conscious only of itself. This is Kavalya or Asamprajanata, Samadhi. 3. 51 Snyupaniman Tree Saga, Smekaram Punar, Anaya, Prasagstani, Celestial Beings, Upanaman Tree, Upon the Invitation, Saga, Attachment, Smeya, Smile, Conceit, Akaram, Not Performing, Puna, Again, Anaya, Undesirable, Prasagd, Inclination Toward, Attachment If Solicited by Celestial Beings, the yogi should not become smug, because the tendency toward undesirable consequences can once again manifest. As was discussed earlier, according to Hindu cosmology, this material universe contains numerous variegated realms, including celestial realms, attained by the pious performance of good karma in the earthly realm, the Pwya of 2. 14. Karma, we recall, manifests in type of birth, quality of life experience, and lifespan, and so the denizens of these celestial realms enjoy the highest births in Sasra, superb sensual capabilities and quality of experience, and extraordinarily long lifespans by human comparison. Such attainments are therefore enticing, and, indeed, were a major goal of the old Vedic ritualism as well as of the MMA with Makron SA with Makron school current in Patanjali's time. Patanjali suggests that these celestial beings can attempt to lure the yogi, who, having attained omnipotence and omniscience, has powers that have now surpassed even those of the celestials, away from his or her practices. Vyasa begins his commentary by noting that there are four classes of yogi. First is the Prathama, Kalpika, whom he describes as one who is practicing and in whom the light is dawning. Vijanabhiku suggests that such a yogi may have attained stages of samadhi such as Savitarka, in which case he or she is an advanced albeit still not fully accomplished practitioner. Next is the Madhu, Bhumika, one who has attained the Tumhar. Tumhar insight, referred to in I. 48. Vijanabhiku connects this, by the process of elimination, with Nirvitarka, samadhi. A third type of yogi is the prajna, Chudi, who has control over the elements and the sense organs, and who knows all that has been known and all that has to be known. Vijanabhiku says that such a yogi has attained the state of Vaisoka noted in 3. 49, and, indeed, all attainments accruing prior to the state of Asamprajanata, Samadhi. Finally, there is the Atikranta, Bhavaniya, whose sole aim is to dissolve the mind back into Prakti, such that Purua can now shine forth unfettered. Vyasa associates the sevenfold insight, referred to in 2. 27, with this fourth type of yogi. According to Vijanabhiku and Vekaspati Misra, the specific type of individual referred to by Patanjali in the sutra corresponds to the second category of yogi mentioned by Vyasa, the Madhu, Bhumika. In other words, when the yogi reaches the Madhu, Bhumika stage, the celestial 
demigods endeavor to tempt him or her away from proceeding on the path, Stani, Upanamantra. This type of yogi is the target of the demigods' attention, since the first category of yogi is too neophyte to concern the demigods, the third has surpassed temptation, and the fourth has surpassed even the sphere of cognitive thought. The Madhu, Bhumika then is a prime target for celestial temptations. In Vyasa's version of events, the demigods in their various celestial realms, seeing the yogi progressing on the path, attempt to divert him, hey there, sit here. Enjoy here. This experience is enjoyable. This maiden is pleasurable. This elixir counteracts disease and old age. This vehicle flies through the air. These are the wish, fulfilling trees. 104 here is the pure Mandakini river. 105 these are the perfected yogis and the sages. Here are the most beautiful and sweetly disposed Apsara nymphs. Here is clairvoyance. And supernormal hearing powers. Here is a body as strong as a thunderbolt. You have earned all these by your good qualities. Come and partake of all this. This place, dear to the gods, knows no death, decay, or old age. 106 The stalwart yogi, however, must be guarded against such allurements, and being addressed in this way, should contemplate the dangers of attachment, burnt by the fearsome flames of worldly existence, and tossed around in the darkness of birth and death, I have somehow or other obtained the light of yoga, which destroys dense darkness. These winds of sensual enjoyment, which are born of desire, are obstacles to the goal of yoga. Having obtained that light, how on earth can I be deceived by the illusion of sensual pleasure and again make myself fuel for the burning fire of worldly existence? Good riddance to you sensual pleasures, which are like a dream, and aspired for only by wretched people. 107 The yogi should become firm of resolve, continues Vyasa, and turn his back on such temptations. But there is a further danger even here, he should not even give a smile of satisfaction, thinking that he is being entreated even by the demigods. If he becomes smug, thinking himself securely situated, he will fail to realize that he is grasped by the hair by death. 108 In this way, continues Vyasa, forgetfulness of the true self, which is so hard to overcome, ever on the lookout for a weak spot, will find a point of entry, reactivate the klesas, and undesirable consequences ensue. 109 But the diligent yogi becomes neither attached nor, perhaps as important, proud of his non-attachment. Such a yogi will eventually attain success. As early as the Muaka Upaniyad there is fairly scorching criticism, in this case directed against the Vedic ritualists, of those striving to attain the attractions of the celestial realms by sacrificial rites, because of desire, those who are given to rites, do not understand. When their time in the celestial realms has expired, they fall down, tormented. Believing sacrifices and gifts to be the highest, fools think there is nothing better than this. When they have enjoyed the fruits of their good deeds in the higher realms, they return back down to this inferior world. I. 2.9-10 the Jita takes the same view of celestial attainments, ignorant people proclaim the flowery words of the Veda, O Arjuna. Delighting in Vedic doctrine, they say there is nothing else. There. Hearts full of desires and aspiring for the celestial realms, they perform many varied and intricate rituals with the goal of attaining enjoyment and power. For those attached to power and opulence, whose minds are stolen by such things, an undeviating boot high fixed in samadhi is not attained, too. 42-44 After having enjoyed the spacious celestial realm, they then enter the world of mortals when their pious karma has expired. 9. 21. 3. 52 ka, tad, krameo sayam vivka, jajena ka, moment, instant, tad, it's the moments, krameo, sequence, succession, sayamd, from performing sayama on, vivka, discrimination, jam, born of, jnanam, knowledge. By performing sayama on the moment, 
and its sequence, one attains knowledge born of discrimination. The smallest moment, ka, in time, referred to here by Patanjali, requires, for its definition, an understanding of the AU. AU, literally minute, in the quantitative sense of tiny, a term typically translated by Indologists of the 19th century and subsequently retained as atom, is the smallest individualized particle of matter in existence. An AU is an irreducible entity in the sense that it cannot be broken down into smaller parts, whereas atoms are reducible into smaller entities, such as electrons and protons, etc. So atom is not an accurate translation. We will retain the term AU for this discussion with this in mind, I have, for this reason, sometimes referred to it previously, somewhat unsatisfactorily, as subatomic particle. Of course, as Vijanabhika rightly points out, as themselves are ultimately composed of the Gwas, they are simply the smallest entities into which the Gwas can exist in the distinct forms of the Mahabhudas, gross elements of earth, water, etc. Without reverting to subtler energies such as the Tan Matras or Ahakra, etc. 110 Just as the AU is the smallest point of matter, the Ka, moment, mentioned in this sutra is the smallest point in time. A ka is defined as the time it takes for an AU to move from one point in space to the next point. Vyasa does not specify how close together these points are, but one can infer that he is referring to the smallest possible distance, which corresponds to a distance equal to the AU's own minute size, thus, a moment is the time it takes for the AU to move to the space immediately adjacent to its previous location. The sequence, Krama, mentioned by Patanjali refers to a succession of such moments. Having said this, Vyasa points out that notions of time such as hour, day, night, year, and so forth, have no tangible metaphysical reality they are simply concoctions of the mind, that is, socially agreed upon constructions that have proved useful in organizing human existence. But in actuality all time, as a metaphysical category, really consists of inska is motion specifically, it is ultimately the motion of the us that comprise matter. Human societies assign labels to significant motions of visible matter such as the apparent movement of the sun, which is in essence a large conglomeration of primarily fire atoms. To the apparent motion of this conglomeration through the sky, we assign the term day, to the motion of the earth around the sun, we apply the label year, etc. Such terms, however, have no ultimate metaphysical reality, for the yogi, the only metaphysical reality corresponding to the notion of time is that of the motion of Oz. 111 with this in mind, continues Vyasa, there is no reality to the past or to the future. Two moments of the same A you cannot exist simultaneously. An atom can move only from one moment to the next, which is a sequence. The AU cannot be perceived in its previous location and its subsequent one simultaneously the sequence can be viewed only progressively. Therefore, from the perspective of this metaphysics, or perhaps, more accurately, traditional Hindu physics, there is only one moment in all reality the present. The earlier moment has ceased to be by becoming, or moving into, the present, at which time it no longer exists in its previous location, and the future has yet to be, or be moved into. Now, since the moments of a succession cannot be perceived simultaneously, from a certain perspective, and as Vekaspati Misra puts it, they are not real. Harry Harananda elaborates that reality is that which exists, and existence refers to that which is present, that is, has presence. Terms such as past and future actually refer to that which we cannot perceive because they are not present. In this sense, they do not actually exist. Thus, collectivities or successions of moments, such as notions of day or year, have no objective or actual metaphysical reality, they are merely conceptually real. One can, however, notes Vyasa, say that the past and future are inherent in the present, and that therefore the entirety of reality is compressed or encapsulated in each moment. With all this in mind, Patanjali is stating here that if one performs sayama on moments and their succession, 
which the commentators have presented as being the minute movement of Oz, true knowledge of reality born of discrimination arises. And this reality embodies the past and future, which is nothing other than this very movement of atoms, or, as Patanjali calls it, the succession of moments. The accomplished yogi at this stage can grasp the entirety of reality with its atomic motions, at all times. Vaikaspati Misra and Vijanabhiku have different views of the relevance of the sutra at this stage of the text. Vaikaspati Misra understands the omniscience previously mentioned throughout the sutras to be rhetorical, for example, when a person states, we have tasted all vegetables, he or she actually means that a large variety of vegetables has been tasted but not literally that there is not a single vegetable in existence that has not been tasted. In this sutra, However, he understands Patanjali's intent to indicate literal and absolute omniscience. Vijanabhiku, on the other hand, understands the practice of Sayama mentioned here to be an alternate means or technique to obtain the omniscience mentioned previously. The next sutra elaborates on this discussion. 3. 53 Jati, Lekha, Desir Anyatane Vakadat Tulayos Tata Pratipati Jati, Species, Lekha, distinguishing characteristic dia location place anyata difference and a vacadot not separated tulyayo of two comparable things tata from this pratipati knowledge ascertainment as a result of this there is discernment of two comparable things that are not distinguishable by species characteristics or location the previous sutra discussed the role of the moment that is, the relationship between moment as a construct and the actual movement of Oz, in order to explain how the yogi can fully and absolutely understand any material phenomenon. This discussion was prompted by Patanjali attempting to clarify and define the claims of omniscience made in 3. 49. The present sutra continues that discussion, by presenting yet another schema for analyzing reality. According to the sutra, any two objects in reality can generally be distinguished according to their species, jiti, characteristics, lekha, and location, disa. Thus, says Vyasa, if two things have the same characteristics and are in the same place, they can be distinguished if their species or type is different. A cow and a horse are distinguishable because their species are different, even if they have similar characteristics, for example, they are both black with four legs and are herbivores, and even if they are in the same place, they live in the same field. Similarly, two entities can be distinguished if their characteristics are different, even if their species and location are the same. Two cows, despite being of the same species and in the same field, might be distinguishable if one is black and is temperamental and the other is brown and is sweet-natured. And, again, Two entities can be distinguished even if they are of the same species and have the same characteristics if their location is different. Two identical amulika fruits can be distinguished if one is situated in front and one at the back of the other despite being of the same species and having identical characteristics. But what would happen, asks Vyasa, if someone switched the placement of the two fruits when the yogi wasn't looking, to test his yogic discernment, suggests Vaikaspati Misra, such that the fruit that had been in the front was now in the back and vice versa. How could the difference between the two be determined? After all, the claims to higher knowledge and omniscience that have been bandied about throughout the text would require that there be no area of information, however trivial, beyond the purview of the yogi adept at Sayama. The two fruits are different, obviously, because, although all other variables such as species, characteristics, and, when switched around, location might be equal, with regard to the latter, they occupy the same location at different times, one fruit was placed in front first and then removed, and the other was placed there a few moments later when the yogi wasn't looking. The qualified yogi, says Vyasa, and of course Isvara, can perceive this difference physically, not just theoretically, even though it is indistinguishable to the common person, because of understanding the moment and its sequences, the atomic movements of Oz, as analyzed in the previous sutra, 
occupying any particular space. Moving the discussion back to the subatomic level, since us are always in motion, and two us cannot occupy the exact same space at the exact same time, a yogi who has mastery over Sayama can perceive whether the us and their sequences occupying a particular space are the same as those that were there previously, even though the cluster of us will be identical in all other ways, in species, characteristic, and location. In other words, the yogi can perceive that the individual us and their sequencing in the second Amulika fruit, the moments connected to this fruit, are not the same as those of the us occupying the same space in the first fruit and could thus understand that they have been switched around. Harry Harananda usefully compares this type of knowledge to a scientist who, with a microscope, could, in principle, at least, tell the subtle difference in the atomic makeup of two identical freshly minted coins if their relative positions were switched around, but a normal person could not. In short, whereas a common person can distinguish between things based on differences in their species, characteristics, and location, only a yogi can distinguish between things based on their subatomic moments in time. Vyasa notes that in the unmanifest stage of Prakti before the creation of the manifest world, when the Gwas are all latent and inactive there are no distinct material entities, and thus nothing can be discerned. It is from the motion and interaction of the Gwas, which we call time. That matter manifests, as a result of which us emerge and things become perceivable. The yogi's perception in Sayama extends to the difference between the specific permutations of the Gwas manifesting in the form of one AU and those manifesting in another. Omniscience thus extends to the minutest levels of physical reality, as Patanjali indicated in I. 40. 3. 54 Trika Sarva, Vyaya Sarvada, Vyayam Akrama Siddhi Vivka, Jajana Tarakam, one who liberates, Sarva, everything, Vyayam, object, Sarvada, everywhere, Vyayam, object, Akramam, without sequence, CA, and, ITI, thus, Vivka, Jam, born of discrimination, Jainanam, knowledge knowledge born of discrimination, is a liberator, it has everything as its object at all times simultaneously. Tarka, liberator, says Vyasa, suggests that the knowledge referred to here comes as a spontaneous flash of insight and not from teachings or books. Books consists of words, and words refer only to generalities, states Vijanabhiku, see discussion in Sutra I. 49. While the type of perception described in these sutras is so specific it can tell the difference between two identical laws. It has everything as its object, sarva, vyaya, because nothing is beyond its purview. Past, present, and future are perceived, and perceived without sequence, akrama, meaning that the past and the future are seen as inherent in the moment, that is, in the present. This perception is liberating, say the commentators, because it carries one over the ocean of birth and death. The yoga, pradipa, light of yoga, says Vyasa, begins with the Madhumti stage and ends. Here with knowledge born of discrimination. Vijanabhiku says that this Madhumti is the same stage of Samadhi as the Madhu, Bhumika mentioned by Vyasa in his commentary in 3. 51. Madhu means sweet, and Vekaspati Misra states that this is because the state of Samadhi causes sweet bliss. Yoga starts at the Madhumti stage and goes through the seven states mentioned in 2. 27, say the commentators, it encompasses all stages of Samprajanata, Samadhi, and all of these stages are parts of and lead to the knowledge born of discrimination, Vivka, Jajananam. 3. 55 Sattva, Puruayo Sati, Samai Kival Yamiti Sattva, the pure intellect, Puruayo, of the Purua, pure consciousness, Sati, purity, Samai, upon becoming equal, Kival Yam. Absolute independence, Iti, thus it is said when the purity of the intellect is equal to that of the Purua, Kavalya liberation ensues. When the sattva element in the buddhai, intellect, becomes completely purged of rajas and tamas, states Vyasa, and all the klesas have been eliminated, 
sattva becomes almost as pure as purua, sati, samaya. Obviously it remains inert prakti, but, devoid of all obscuring factors, it almost starts to resemble purua, as it were, and can now reflect purua perfectly it is in the sense that it becomes equal to purua insofar as it becomes a perfect reflection of purua. When a mirror is completely free of defects or dirt, it can reflect a face back to itself without any distortion and, in this sense, becomes, indirectly, equal to that which it reflects. Now, due to Buddha's transparency, there is no more false state or experience attributed to the self, since the Purua can now see itself clearly in its original pure state. At this stage, whether or not one has developed the stimistic powers, the state of Kavalya, described in 350, is imminent. The ultimate discrimination of the difference between the Buddhai itself and Purua is the last cognitive act of Buddhai. Then Buddhai ceases to function, says Hari Harananda. After gaining this discrimination, Purua can rest in its own awareness, as independent of the intellect as the real face behind the mirror rather than the reflected face peering back, so to speak hence the term Kavalya, aloneness, or independence. It is now uncoupled from the intellect and the world of forms that it presents to Purua. Vyasa notes that it is not the mystic powers that bring about Kavalya but the discriminative knowledge of the previous sutra. Once discriminative knowledge arises, ignorance is dispelled. Vyasa uses the term Adarsana here for ignorance, which literally means not seeing. Not seeing the real self is what ignorance actually is, the mind is. Ignoring the self that animates it. Vyasa reminds us that ignorance is the root of all the klesas, thus, once ignorance is removed, the klesas cease to exist. In the absence of the klesas, there are no more seeds of karma, no consequent future births, and therefore no more sasra. In this stage, says Vyasa, the gwas no longer present themselves as objects to be experienced by Purua. With no more external objects of experience, Purua is now in the state of Kavalya mentioned in the Sutra. Since awareness is eternal, and therefore must always be aware of something, now with nothing other than itself of which to be aware no other Purua can be aware only of self. This is Kavalya, only aware of selfness. The self now shines freely and purely in its own right. For Vijanabhiku, as a theist, this state additionally entails becoming inseparable, but as distinct individuals, from God, Isvara. The other commentators ponder Vyasa's suggestion that the these mystic powers, are unnecessary. Unnecessary for ultimate self, awareness. Why would Patanjali spend so much time discussing them? They ask. After all, as Vijanabhika points out, one has to have some element of desire in order to attain sthis. In any event, all commentators agree that the sthis outlined in this chapter are by, products of the path, not fundamental to it. Indeed, the sthis are still within the realm of suffering, as Hari Harananda notes, since their scope is still prakti. One might surmise that the sthis are believed to manifest spontaneously and hence Patanjali sees fit to inform the aspiring yogi of symptoms that will be encountered on the path so the yogi can be alerted not to be distracted and sidetracked by them. In any event, say the commentators, they are certainly not the direct cause of Kavalya, only discriminative knowledge is. Iti Patanjali, Virasid Yoga, Sutra Bhuti, thus ends the third chapter on Samadhi in the Yoga Sutras composed by Patanjali. Chapter Summary The chapter begins by concluding the definitions of the last three limbs of Yoga 1-3, which are distinguished from the others by constituting Sayama 4-6 and being internal limb 7-8. A discussion of the state of Naraya ensues 9-12, followed by the metaphysics of the relationship between substratum and characteristic 13-15. The remainder of the chapter is then dedicated to an extensive discussion of various mystic powers accrued from the performance of Sayama on a variety of things 16 to 48, culminating in omniscience followed by ultimate Kavalya liberation 49 to 55. Catered Ha Kavalya, the chapter 4 Absolute Independence 4. 1 Janmauti, 
Mantra, Tapa, Samadhi, Jaya with Makron Sadeya Janma, Birth, Odi, Medicine, Herbs, Mantra, Sacred Chants, Tapa, Austerity, Samadhi, Meditative Absorption, Jaya with Makron, Born, Arise, Sadeya, The Mystic Powers The Mystic Powers Arise Due to Birth, Herbs, Mantras, The Performance of Austerity, and Samadhi. Patanjali states that the mystic powers described in the previous section can be produced by a number of means. Powers attained as a by, product of samadhi, the last on his list, have already been discussed in detail in the previous chapter, but powers can be attained in four other ways, according to the sutra. Firstly, they can be the result of activities done in a previous birth, janma, which have reached their fruition in this birth. For example, Celestial beings have mystic powers, and one can be born as a celestial being endowed with various these due to the good karma one accrued in a previous birth as a human. Fallen yogis too, who may not have attained the ultimate goal of yoga, but nonetheless perhaps attain some of the these, pick up in a next birth from where they left off in their past life, as indicated in the Gita, 6. 37 ff, and expressed in the story of Jabitrata. Jabitrata outlined in 3. 7. For that matter, quips Pojaraja, even taking birth as a bird affords one the power of traveling through the air, which is supernormal from human perspectives. Secondly, Patanjali states that these powers can also be produced from certain herbs, Odi, and the commentators mention elixirs used by the Asuras, supernatural beings, but note that such herbal concoctions are available in this world as well. Akara refers here to Soma, a plant described in the early Vedic texts, a favorite beverage of Indra, chief of the celestials, which bestowed supernormal powers when imbibed. One Hari Harananda even mentions modern chloroform as sometimes triggering out of body experiences. Thirdly, powers can also be produced by reciting certain mantras, say Patanjali, and the commentators. The entire ancient Vedic sacrifical cult was predicated on the power of mantra which in the earlier period referred to the Vedic hymns to manipulate cosmic forces to produce effects. And the power of mantra to produce supernormal effects has remained consistent in the Indic traditions ever since. Finally, one can fulfill one's wishes, whatever they may be, through austerities, tapas. There are numerous stories in the Puras describing how, by the performance of austerities, even demoniac personalities attain superhuman powers. Desiring immortality, Hiraiakaipu, for example, performed intense austerities. He stood on his toes with arms outstretched in a type of a VK Sana pose for so long that ants covered his body in an anthill and consumed everything except his bones and life heirs. As a result of the powers he accrued, the entire universe was disturbed, and so Brahma appeared before the demon asking him what he sought. Hiraiakaipu asked for immortality, but Brahma informed him that even he himself, the engineer of the universe, was mortal and thus he could not bestow what he himself did not possess. The demon consequently requested that he not be killed by any created being, inside or outside, during the day or night, on the earth or in the air, or by any weapon. The wily demon thought he had thus circumvented all possible causes of death. However, Vayu incarnated as Narasiha, half man half lion, thus neither man nor beast, and killed him on the threshold, neither inside nor outside, at dawn, neither day nor night, on his lap, neither on the ground nor in the air, and with his nails, not with any weapons, Bhagavata Pura 7. 3. The various legends of practically every culture of the ancient world are replete with stories of magical powers ensuing from birth, incantations, herbal concoctions, etc. In this vein, Patanjali is here stating that these are not exclusively the prerogative of Samadhi states. 4. Tujati, Anthara, Paramaprakti, Apurajati, Birth, Anthara, Other, Parama, Change, Prakti, material nature, apurad, 
because of the filling in the changes in bodily forms that take place in other births is due to the filling in by prakti. When one is reborn, one receives a new body. The process by which this new body evolves, its parama, is described in the sutra as due to the filling in of prakti. We have discussed how, due to the subtle causes of karma performed in life, seeds are planted that fructify in future births. These seeds cause an individual to change one body for a completely different body that of a human, celestial, elephant, ant, or any other being. The process by which the pyrktic configuration of the new body takes place is described here as prakti. Filling in, apura, the new form. The verb a with makron p can also mean to pour into so one can perhaps envision the evo eludes of prakti being poured into or filling in the new form as an elephant, human, or whatever being, in accordance with the klesas and saskras embedded in the siddha of the old form, siddha, of course, is not created anew each birth as the gross body is, but is transferred from birth to birth. So the particular blueprint of the next body embedded in the subtle matter of siddha in accordance with the saskras of that specific siddha is filled in, or materialized, by the gross elements. There is constant recycling in prakti. In cosmic terms, too, as any of the EVO eludes of prakti propagate further EVO eludes as buddhai manifests ahakra from itself, or, in turn, Ahakra manifests the ten matras any depletion that is incurred is filled in by prakti which, being infinite, is never depleted. To illustrate this principle, Vijanabhika refers to the story of Vamana from the Bhagavata. Pra. 8. 21 FF. Vamana was an incarnation of Vayu who appeared as a small Brahma boy in the court of Bali, the king of the demons. Bali was harassing the celestial gods, Although in fact he was a great devotee of Vayu but had been born to a family of demons due to some quirk of fate in his karma. As a result of this birth he was acting inimically toward the celestial demigods, according to the dharma of his kind. However, as a devotee Bali also respected the Vedic dharma of being dutiful toward Brahmas, and so, upon being approached by Vamana, offered him a boon of his choice. Vamana simply asked for whatever land could be encompassed by three steps. Bali, as conqueror of the universe, although eager to give much more, was happy to provide this. With his first step, Vamana covered the entire earth, and with his second, the universe. With nowhere left to place his third step, Vamana accused Bali, in a somewhat tongue, in, cheek fashion, of failing to fulfill his promise of granting granting him his three steps of land. Failing to fulfill a promise is an intolerable notion for a proud and principled monarch of the epic genre. Bali bowed before Vamana and asked him to place the third step on his head, thereby illustrating his devotion to Vayu. The point of the story in the context of the Bhagavata is that no one is disqualified by birth or status from devotion to God, not even demons, but Vijanabhika refers to the story to illustrate the principle of prakti filling in or perhaps rather filling out a body. Vamana's tiny form was transformed into a form so enormous it could encompass the universe with one step. Prakti filled in the new, larger form from the old. In short, gross matter emanates out of subtler matter and fills in the various forms of the universe. 4. 3 Nimitami Prayahaka Praktan Vara Bedas tu tata ketra kavat nimitam, instrumental or efficient cause, a prayahakam, is not the instigator, motivator, praktan, of the pyrktic causes, the original causes, vera, protective covering, beta, piercing, tu, but, tata, from it prakti, ketrika, farmer, vat, like the instrumental cause of creation is not its creative cause, but it pierces the covering from creation like a farmer pierces the barriers between his fields. The gwas of prakti, as we know, are the creative cause of manifest reality, since all creation emanates from the interaction among them. The issue at stake here is what causes the gwas of prakti to activate and produce the effects of the world. Is it what Patanjali terms the instrumental causes, nimitakra, which the commentators take to refer to Dharma and Adharma, 
the meritorious or non-meritorious activities of human beings. In other words, following up on the previous sutra of Prakti filling in the ever, changing forms of the world, the question is raised indirectly whether it is because of the soul's dharmic and adharmic activities that Prakti activates the effects of the world, such as the new bodies obtained during reincarnation, as karmic reactions to these meritorious or non-meritorious activities. The MMA with Makron SA with Makron school, for example, which denies the existence of Isvara, posits the existence of an unseen power called Atta, which essentially corresponds to the law of karma, as the force responsible for generating the results of Dharma and Adharma. Patanjali here rejects Dharma and Adharma as ultimate causal agents. Dharma and Adharma, note the commentators, are themselves the effects of Prakti, so they cannot be its causes. But they do remove the obstacles to Prakti taking a certain course. They are thus the instrumental causes that can channel or direct specific effects emerging from within the pre-existing substratum creative cause of the quiz of Prakti. Patanjali analogizes creativity to the acts of a farmer, Ketrika, Vat. When a farmer wants to irrigate a field at a lower or equal level to an adjacent field that is already inundated with water, elaborates Vyasa, he does not personally carry the water from one field to the other with his hands but merely removes the barrier or dam between the two fields, Vera, Beda, so that the water can spontaneously drain out of the irrigated field and into the adjacent one. Similarly, the farmer does not personally insert water into the roots of the grain, he removes the weeds from the environs that impede the natural tendency of water to flow downward, and the water then penetrates the roots by itself. Likewise, continues Vyasa, Dharma and Adharma counteract each other, and pursuing Dharmic or Adharmic activities in life causes the removal of the blockages that obstruct Prakti from creating or filling in a particular Dharmic or Adharmic body appropriate to these activities. So Dharma and Adharma act as guides or channels through which Prakti can flow, like the barriers and dams in the farmer's field, but they do not instigate the initial motion of Prakti herself in the first place. Hence this sutra says the instrumental cause is not the creative cause, a prayahaka, but it does remove barriers within it. The commentators discuss other instrumental causes that control the movements of Prakti, such as Isvara. Rearticulating the standard theistic argument in Nyaya, Hindu thought, too they note that Isvara is the essential instrumental cause in activating Prakti. In the production of a pot, the other instrumental and material causes the initial idea or blueprint of the pot, and the clay, water, and potter's will are useless without the instrumental cause of the potter. Like the potter, Isvara, in conjunction with other instrumental causes such as Kala, time, and Dharma and Adharma that is, karma and its consequences is the instrumental cause that awakens the inherent power of prakti to produce its effects, says Vijanabhiku. 3. And, most important, it is ultimately Isvara who removes the obstacles in prakti such that dharma and adharma may generate their respective fruits, says Vekaspati Misra. Isvara is the ultimate overseer who ensures that deeds are connected to their appropriate fruits. And, of course, on another level, and ironically, one can note that Puru itself is an indirect cause, since Prakti exists simply for its sake, too. 18. Creation, the initial activation of Prakti from its latent state, as accepted almost universally in classical Hindu thought, with the exception of the early MMA with Makron SA with Makron school, is a cyclical process, the universes emanate from their source and then dissolve back into it at the end of each cycle before a new cycle is activated. This is a never ending process that is considered to be unadi, beginningless. Thus, Indic thought in general does not occupy itself with notions of a primordial, pre-cyclical initial impetus of Pirktic Big Bang, if you will. This is not seen as a useful topic of speculation, or, rather, any initial impetus is denied by conceiving of cyclical creationality as beginningless. In any event, the point here is that once activated by the instrumental causes, Prakti's inherent qualities impel it to flow in accordance with the channels of human activity, dharma, and adharma, 
just as water's own qualities impel it to flow to a lower place once the obstacles damming it have been removed. 4. For Nirma, Sydney Usmita, Matrat Nirma, created, Sydney, minds, Usmita, ego, Matrat, only. Created minds are made from ego only. One of the stis commonly held to be attainable by accomplished yogis is the ability of an individual yogi to create numerous personal bodies, a feat also noted in Vedanta Sutras 4. 4.15 The commentators understand the sutra to be addressing the question of whether these multiple bodies each have individual siddhas, or whether they all have the same siddha, namely, the siddha of the yogi creating the bodies. The consensus is that each of the bodies created by the yogi has its own individual mind, and these minds are all manifested from and are subordinate to the yogi's ego. We recall that Siddha, in the restricted sense of manas, as opposed to buddhai, ahakra, and manas, for is a manifestation of ego, ahakra, in skin metaphysics. Thus, it would appear that an accomplished yogi can manifest multiple minds, rather than just one, from the ego. 5. If there were just a single mind for multiple bodies, says Akara, there would be no scope for the different bodies to exhibit different activities, so these bodies would end up as if lifeless. In other words, if all the bodies performed exactly the same thing by virtue of having a single, unitary directing mind, they would effectively have no life of their own, but would all act like synchronized puppets or else there would also need to be individual Atmans to experience these different bodies and minds, continues Vijanabhiku, not just the one Atman of the Yogi creating the bodies. Six even incarnations of Isvara exhibit different minds, he points out, when Rama, an incarnation of Vayu, exhibited unawareness of his divine nature, seven he was obviously experiencing a different mental state from that of the omniscient Vayu. Be this as it may, all commentators accept that a yogi can manifest multiple bodies and undertake different experiences in one body practicing austerities, in another experiencing the objects of the senses, etc. Says Vijanabhiku. There is a similar discussion in the Vedanta Sutras, 4. 4.15, where the metaphor of a lamp is provided, as one lamp can light numerous individual and separate wicks, which then exhibit their own light, so the yogi's consciousness can animate several bodies. Again, the Bhagavata Pura, 3. 21-23, provides an illustration of this sthi in the story of the sage Kardama. Kardama, a hermit living on the banks of the Sarasvati river, accepted the hand of the princess Devahuthi on the condition that he depart for the forest once she had conceived a son by him. Despite being accustomed to royal comforts, Devahuthi served her husband in his simple hermitage with absolute love and dedication, and consequently became weak and emaciated as a result of her austerities and spiritual practices. Eventually, won over by her devotion, the renounced and reclusive ascetic determined to fulfill her desire for a son. Marshalling some of the mystic powers outlined in the previous chapter, the sage manifested a palace filled with precious gems and all manner of opulence, and arranged for Devahuthi to regain her former beauty. In order to fulfill the desires of his beautiful wife, who longed for sexual pleasure, the sage then exhibited the mystic power referred to by Patanjali in the sutra by dividing himself into nine personal forms, so as to better satisfy her completely. As an aside, the son whom Devahuthi eventually bore was named Kapila, the sage who taught the Skid doctrine. Tradition thus bears record of perhaps two Kapalas. The Kapala mentioned in the Svetasvatara Upaniyad, who received instruction from Hara, Shiva, v. 2, is taken by Akara in his commentary to that verse to be different from the Kapala accepted as an incarnation of Vayu in the Bhagavata, as well as the Mahabharata, the Jita, and the Ahirbhatna, noted earlier 8, but both appear in theistic contexts. As noted earlier, the theistic skya, also amply evidenced in the Moka, Dharma section of the Mahabharata and remaining current in the Puric tradition, is in all probability older than the non-theistic variants that surface in Varaka Skya, Karaka, despite the fact that the latter text becomes, 
by default, the seminal text for the Ski school, all earlier traditions being lost except in the scattered references noted earlier. 4. 5. Prapti, Ved Praya Hakam Siddhamakam Anekam Prapti, Activity, Ved, Difference, Praya Hakam, The Instigator, Director, Siddham, Mind, Akam, One, Anekam, Of the many there is one mind, among the many created by the yogi, which is the director in the different activities of the different bodies. What prevents the multiple minds in the various bodies created by the yogi from competing with each other in terms of their desires and degenerating into disharmony or conflict? Asks Vekaspati Misra. This sutra is taken to indicate that although the yogi is able to create an individual mind for each body he or she chooses to generate, these bodies are all under the guidance or control of a principal mind, Praya Hakam Siddham. Just as the one mind can control the multiple limbs of a person's body and its sense functions, say the commentators, so the master mind of the yogi controls the subordinate minds inserted into the created bodies. Here the yoga tradition follows the position of the Vedanta tradition, which, as noted, also raises this topic, for 4.15. Nine mind is potentially omnipresent, after all, Hari Harananda reminds us, thus there is no far or near for it, nor any impediment to it manifesting in multiple, distinct bodies. The controlling mind is the perfected mind of the yogi, says Vijanabhiku, and the intention or will of this mind governs the activities of the other minds. Thus, through these multiple bodies, the yogi can engage in multiple experiences simultaneously. He can then withdraw these bodies into his original form as the sun withdraws its rays, says Vekaspati Misra. 4. 6. Tatradhyana, Jam Anasayam Tatra, from these the minds who have attained these indicated in 4. 1. Dhyana, Jam, born from meditation, Anasayam, is without the storehouse or stock of karma from these five types of minds that possess these, the one born of meditation is without the storehouse of karma. The first sutra of this chapter stated that these could be attained by five different means, only one of which is through meditation, the others. Being through birth, herbs, mantras, and the performance of austerity. However, says Vyasa, only the mind that has attained the sthis through meditation is free from the vice and virtue accruing from the performance of dharma or adharma, and thus from the karma that is accrued thereby, which is stored in the siddha in what is termed the asaya, a type of receptacle, stock, or store of all the accumulated karma, I. 24, 2. 12. As discussed, this karma eventually fructifies, perpetuating the cycle of birth and death. Therefore, although a person may possess and exhibit these gained as a result of birth, herbs, mantras, or austerities, such a person is not freed from the klesas, which underpin all sasric actions and in turn provoke karma and its ensuing results, c2. 12-13. Such people may have astonishing powers, but they are nonetheless as helplessly bound by the laws of sasra as anybody else, as was illustrated in the story of Hiriakaipu. This is not the case, however, with the yogi who has attained the sthis by meditation, dhyana, jaya, in other words, as a by, product of samadhi. According to Patanjali, only through the practice of yoga is one free from the klesas and their consequences. Therefore, one should not assume that someone with mystical powers is automatically a yogi or, indeed, even a benevolent person as is underscored in Hindu folklore. The Puras are full of stories of Asuras, demons, who attain powers by tapas, austerities. Hiriakaipu utilized the powers that were bestowed on him to harass the entire universe. This included his own saintly son Prahlada, since the demon could not tolerate his son's devotion to Vayu. Rava from the Ramaya, who was also eventually destroyed by Vayu in the form of Rama, likewise received his awesome supernormal powers by performing austerities, as, indeed, did almost all the great demons in Hindu lore. In short, the yoga tradition, along with most other soteriological traditions of ancient India, 
takes the position that real yogis do not display their powers, therefore, anyone doing so may very well have attained any semblance of sthi power from birth, herbs, mantras, or austerity and is likely exhibiting them to manipulate gullible people. Except in very rare circumstances, and then for pedagogical purposes, the cheap display of sthis is not viewed as the sign of an enlightened being in popular yogic narrative. 4. 7. Karmukalka Yoginas Tri, Vidamitaram Karma, Action, and its Reaction, Ajukla, not white, Akham, not black, Yogina, of the Yogi, Tri, 3, Vidam, Types, Itaram, of the others. The karma of a yogi is neither white nor black, of everyone else, it is of three types. Vyasa elaborates on the four types of karma alluded to by Patanjali here and divides them into four categories, a widespread schema that surfaces in Buddhist teachings 10. Black ka, karma predictably consists of evil acts performed by the wicked. Black and white karma is the performance of both evil and pious acts. It is everyday action in the external world determined by how one acts toward others. The actions of ordinary people are mixed, people certainly often perform good deeds, but the drive toward self, preservation and gratification invariably sooner or later involves causing harm to others on some level. Thus most people perform both black and white karma. Harry Harananda points out, by way of example, that in tilling the soil, many creatures are killed, and in saving wealth for oneself, others are denied. Purely white, sukla, karma is internal, it is not determined by actions toward others in the external world and thus generative of karma, but is the product of the mind alone. Vyasa specifies that it consists of the performance of austerity, study, and meditation, which are more or less the ingredients of Kriya Yoga. Finally, that which is neither white nor black pertains to the yogi or sannyasi, total renunciant, whose klesas are destroyed and who is finishing up his last birth. Having renounced all the fruits of activity, such a person does not receive either black or white karma. Vijanabhiku hastens to add that this does not apply to someone who has simply donned the garb of a mendicant without giving up personal desire. Rather, he quotes the Muaka Upaniad, the wise man, knowing the truth, does not speak excessively. Sporting in the Atman and delighting in the Atman, such a person performs work in the world and is the best of the knowers of Brahman, 3.1.4. He also quotes, The Jita, having given up attachment to the fruits of work, the yogis perform action in the world through their body, mind, intelligence, and purified senses for the purpose of purifying the Atman, v. 11. All others, including those who have attained the powers through the four means other than samadhi, accrue karma of the other three types, tri, vidha, black, white, or mixed. This is because all other actions ensue from the ahakra, ego, the klesa of usmitha. As long as the klesas underpin actions, more specifically, as long as there is a false sense of self, considering oneself to be the body and mind, underpinning any action, good or bad, or, put differently, as long as one thinks that it is one's pyrktic self who is acting, etymologically, ahakra means I am the doer, then the results of action, whether good or bad, accrue to this self. Vijanabhiku again quotes the Jita, always satisfied, without any dependency, having given up attachment to the fruits of activity. The yogi, although engaged in activity, does not actually do anything, for 20, and